Yay. And I'm ready. Got my wine. Got my normal Chardonnay. Let's have a look who we've got. Welcome everybody. Uh, we've got an here, we've got Andy. Hi, Amok. Jacob. Welcome back, Jacob. Uh, Sackrack as well. Hi. Steps. Hi, guys. Yeah, the Breaking Bad movie. I, I just watched that today, actually. It's quite, quite good. Uh, I feel it should have been an extra two episodes in the series, though, to be honest, but... Um, yeah, it was. it's worth a watch. It's good. Oh, this is my first wine for a long time. Oh, thank you for the resub, Andy. The resub? Oh no, oh, no it's a sub. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciated. Turn my sound up. I only just heard that. There we go. Oh, God, that tastes good. That tastes really good. <laughs> no worries, Andy. No worries. It's all appreciated. It all goes towards more or less. So. Yeah, I did code. We have coded quite a lot. Um, I'm actually I'm struggling to keep up with it with a PDF, to be honest with you. I've been beavering away at it this week. Um, it's going to be another long one. I think it's probably going to hit 40 pages quite easily. Because um, I'm trying to catch up with the stream and it's not it's not the easiest thing to do. Oh, God, it's making me a bit heartburn, that. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, I agree, Harry. It should have been a four-part mini. It, it, they could have easily fitted in to two or three extra episodes in the last season um, somewhere. I mean, it wouldn't have made sense as the very last episode, but um, they could have fit it in, I think, because of the timelines of it. Um, or, or, yeah, made it a mini-series as well. But yeah, it was it was good. I enjoyed watching it. Cool. So um, let's have a look where we were. Hi, Dr. Miz. Welcome to the stream. Ah, yes. Yeah, so we we had our little gummy bear. Um, the start of a behaviour for the gummy bear. Uh, we didn't do much more than that. If I remember rightly, I was kind of a bit spaced out at the time, so. <clears throat> I'm in a topic dedicated to programming multiple loops in 6502. You mean nested loops, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we've covered a few nested loops. So we did, um, with with the, the map, um, the, the map display routine worked in Actually, was that nested loops? No, it wasn't, was it? it did, yeah, it was nested loops, actually. It did columns and rows, so... <clears throat> um, so, the just a bit of information about the 12-hour the stream. It's going to be on October the 26th, which is two weeks today. Um, it's going to be from 5pm um, till 5am. Um, but it is the night the clocks go back in England, so it will actually end up being a 13-hour stream. Which is a uh, kind of good, I guess. It gives me an extra hour, um, <clears throat> but it's also probably twice as long as any stream I've ever done before. So it should be interesting, <laughs> to say the least. <coughs> um, but on that stream, we'll be doing. Um, I mean, I'll be doing a lot less explanation. I will explain some stuff as I go along, but um, it will be kind of quite intense coding. There'll be a lot less um, chit chat and a lot more kind of code. I'll try and explain some stuff as we go along, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to touch on lots and lots of things that um, we, we either haven't done um, on this stream yet or or, um, or won't do. But things like scrolling, screen scrolling, we're going to do a screen scroller as well. Um, will there be tequila? No, not on the 13th. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> There'll be wine. Um, I'm just trying to work out how much wine I need. I think I'm probably going to have the same amount of wine, but I'm going to dilute it with uh, lemonade or something. So um, you can do some music. Yes, that'd be really good. Um, I'm going to start doing some um, 
some background graphics for, for the game this week because I've got a very specific idea how I want it to work. So um, background wise, I kind of need things in a specific way. Um, sprites, I'm not so sure. So if anybody fancies doing uh, Halloween sprites, um, that'd be great. It, it's going to be a side scrolling shoot 'em up. So I'm not sure what that would be. Maybe a ghost or a witch on a broom or something like that. Um, we shall have to see. Um, but yeah, any any music you can do steps that would be great um, beforehand. And there's no there's no um, memory limit. Well, the memory limit 64k. But there's no 16k limit or anything. So uh, multicolor or single color? Um, it's probably going to be multicolor, I'd guess. Um, I think that's probably going to give us the best. Um, I, I like games to be colourful, and as, as much as I like, um, as much as I like some of the high res stuff, I don't think you can really show off um, the Commodore very well with the with the um, uh, with the single colour stuff. I was going to ask how many channels you can use for music. Um, if you're using Goat Tracker, feel free to use all three, um, and we can we can drop out one of the channels for the sound effects. Um, I guess sound effects is another thing if you've if you've got the chance to to kind of create some instruments in in Goat Track that we can use as um, that we can use as sound effects that would be good. Um, I, again, I don't know what they're going to be. I mean, there's all, all I know is it's going to be a side scrolling shoot 'em up. It's going to be procedurally generated, so um, it's going to be never ending, getting increasingly more difficult um, with waves of enemies that just come in that aren't really attached to the background they're just kind of waves that come in um, sound effects are just instruments on the goat tracker channel so you, you, you if you can make an instrument um, that's all you need to do really um, and all that the goat tracker sound effects player does is just load them in uh, as individual kind of elements that you can then play it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting it's hard because you need to use two sprites for one if you use high res and multicolor at the same sprite position. Yeah, I think it's just going to be multicolor. I'm not going to be doing any multiplexer or anything like that. I don't want to. I don't, I, multiplexers can be can be a pain, really. I mean, they're, they're the sort of thing that you can because I'm going to do everything from scratch. So um, it could be something that takes an hour to do. It could be something that takes five hours to do. It really just depends. On the day how well it works so I, I don't want to complicate things by adding a sprite multiplexer in um, so I'm thinking it's going to be one sprite for the main character uh, the bullets are going to be uh, character sprites uh, and then there's going to be uh, five or six enemies and two sprites for their bullets as well so yeah, sprite, yeah exactly Iridium doesn't Iridium uses a similar technique where they have um, it's, it's, they just split up the, the sprites in that way. One, one sprite for the main ship, a few for the enemies, and a couple for bullets. Um, okay, cool. So what we're going to do today, um, I want to try and do two things. First of all, I'm, we're going to flesh out this behavior. Not really a lot left to do on it, um, but what we might try and do um, is, well, we're definitely going to get it to walk. Uh, at the moment, it's just sliding left and right. <laughs> Wine with a silly straw, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going through this wine really quickly. This is the first wine I've had in two weeks, so. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make the walk animation on this work, um, and then what we might do is have it kind of similar to the the kind of bubble bubble behaviors that you see on, on the early enemies, where if you are above an enemy like this and it can jump up to that platform, so it wouldn't be on that one, but say on this one here this would then jump up to this platform so that's something to consider we might do um, I'm not too fussy we don't do that today yeah the Sarah Jane Avery tune up is really good I, I've got a lot of respect for Sarah she's she's a very very good um, coder for the Commodore what she achieved with um, her 16k competition entry in 16 kilobytes is absolutely incredible. Um, she used a lot of really good techniques for kind of compressing things down. Um, yeah, I, I mean, anybody who's not um, played Neutron yet, you should go and download that from itch.io. Um, 
and give it a try. It's a really, really good, uh, really, really good shoot 'em up game. For 16k, it's incredibly impressive. And the new new shoot 'em up she's doing, as it's Soul Star or something, um, is a side scrolling shoot 'em up, and it's it's really, really nice. She's using lots of, um, I mean, well known techniques, but very, very kind of difficult to do correct techniques um, with parallax and um, multi character set scrolling for for um, for parallax layers. Um, she's just got a real knack for for shoot 'em ups, I think, and you can tell when you look at the the videos of the stuff she's posted that the things like the enemy waves and the way that the enemies kind of behave and and the kind of variety in in the behaviors on the enemies is is really really impressive. Um, but she's got like multi multiple layer parallax and um, and not just kind of quite simple. Um, you know, single character or single tile parallax like like you get in in many games, including Doc Two as well. To be fair, um, she's she's um, she's got the whole multi character set scrolling. So she's doing a whole kind of another layer of, of background graphics in quite quite a lot of detail. Yeah, it would be good to dissect. Actually, I think that the interesting thing to dissect with, especially with Neutron, would be how the game unpacks into memory because there's there's a lot of stuff going on there and um, she manages to cram it all into 16k which is quite impressive okay cool let's let's take a look at this behavior then so I, I can kind of remember what we were doing last time you'll have to bear with me while I relearn what we did because my memory of last week is slightly hazy um, let me get another another window open oh uh, can you guys on flu bits just confirm that everything's okay on there as well it should be i've connected and um everything should be okay and up to date i think uh let me just double check yeah it says i'm on there okay that would be cool actually that would be really good to do um to do a dissect with the actual developer there's um i, I kind of want to do a dissect of uh, antonia savona's uh keystone capers as well because there's a i mean it's a, it's a very simple looking game but there's an in, insane amount of things going on in that game um to to do what it's doing um the the, the sprite multiplexer in that is very, very good i mean i think it's zonal so i don't think it's kind of having to do much in the way of um sprite sorting or, or kind of clever uh, raster splits but it is it is dealing with a lot of sprites yeah so <clears throat> like most of the 16 gay competition games um they will have been bigger in memory and then use xmizer to compress it down um but like i mean i did it myself with um uh, with the character sets in in dot cosmos um i i don't actually i i generate them on the fly so instead of um, instead of kind of storing that directly in memory and then just compressing it down, I actually store routine to draw the character sets um, for the pet ski set. There's no point in storing a, 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 another pet ski, um, a, another pet ski character font because it already exists in memory. I just needed to shuffle things around a little bit. Um, and she does similar things. She she unpacks so her scrolling code. Um, in Neutron is a fully unrolled uh, scroll loop, which is why it's capable of doing the, the scroll that it's doing. Um, but obviously, if you were to completely unroll uh, a scrolling loop like that and, and compress it down, you're probably still going to exceed 16k or, uh, or at least not have very much uh, room left on it. Um, oh, hang on. My... I just saw my stream stop. I don't know if it's still working for you guys. Hope so. Might just be my connection on the. Uh, uh, it looks all right, I think. Okay. That freeze just me or three? Yeah, I think it. I think it did freeze then. Okay, interesting. So yeah, tonight we're we're doing um, this stream over five G. Um, so uh, I'm, if there are any hiccups, let me know because um, I do need to assess whether or not um, this is going to be worth it going forward. The, the one thing I will say is I do have terrible Wi-Fi on my computer because um, I broke the aerial off. I've actually got it. Uh, 
damn it. Oh yeah, there it is. So the little kind of turn thing that joins the aerial broke off. Um, so I'm actually running Wi-Fi on my computer without an aerial, so it could be that as well. Um, uh, and the fact that the 5G is actually in the other room. Um, so I think what I'm going to do eventually is move it into here. I just need to find somewhere to set it up in here so that it's better and connect through uh, connect through an Ethernet cable rather than rather than through Wi-Fi. Um, but as long as the, the stream can kind of keep going mostly, then um, we're, we're good. Okay, right. So from what I remember, we'd done some behavior stuff. Let me bring up the behaviors. Um, and we'd done some macros for these behaviors. So let me bring up all the enemy stuff in this side. So I just keep the start on a slim one there like that, because the start's just the start. Let's reduce it down slightly. There we go. And one of the things we did was add this get and set static memory. So this is what we're gonna we're gonna start using um, uh, to do, to do our custom stuff. Uh, let's have a look. So we've got we do have an enemy frame, um, and then there's some static memory. So we're gonna have to use static memory to remember which direction we're walking in. Um, which are we using that already? See, I can't remember at all how we did this behavior. <laughs> Quite bad. Okay, let's have a look. So, we did it on enemy two. There we go. So, on update, uh, we had a direction enemy state. Okay, enemy state is a shared. Okay, so we're using enemy state to, to work out if we're walking left or right. Um, okay, fine. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll add a new um, point to point encrypting. Let's see, I don't know if an apartment building. Port of land over local power circuit. Yeah, I was I was considering doing that, but I, I do have... Uh, I do have some issues um, in the past with those. I don't know if they've improved, but... Um, they they would quite often drop out just for just randomly for no reason, um, and I tried all sorts. I tried putting them on um, unique power sockets so they were just on their own, with nothing else uh, plugged into the wall with it. Um, but I, I had some problems. Oh, that it could have been the the, the ring mains, the house I was at as well. It could have been a problem with the uh, the mains loop as well. So. Interference on the mains would have been a problem, but it was about three years ago, so I don't know if they're if they're better. oh they're still shit, are they? Okay. Yeah, I th I think eventually um, I'm gonna get in here. I'm gonna get um, the five G kind of set up, um, pointing outside towards the because the small cell for our five G is is literally twenty meters over the road. I can see it on the lamppost over the road, so I can point the device at it. Um, and, and get a decent connection but where it is in the front room it can't quite see uh, the device it can't quite see the small cell over the road so I think if I get it in here pointing out my window it will probably probably be a better connection and then with it being in the room I can just connect a wire a LAN wire up directly to the to the machine but I'm gonna wait till I get this thing built so I'm building this monster PC um, slowly but surely <clears throat> it's kind of fun this at the moment so at the moment I've got my PlayStation 4 Pro probably can't see it actually it's just down there um, I've got my PlayStation 4 Pro in pieces I've taken the power supply out and I've got it connected up to a um, <coughs> uh, an ATX power supply I'm just trying to figure out how to power it from from the ATX power supply I've got it running I've got it working on an ATX power supply I just need to figure out how to get it to turn on without the pad now and then that's going to go in the back of this. So I've got PlayStation 4 Pro built into my computer, which should be kind of nice. Okay, right. Let's let's do some setup. So um, on Spawn, what we'll do is we'll 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 set a we'll set a variable. We're going to put the label up here so we know what it is. Uh, this will be the first one, and we'll call this. Um, 
We'll call this walk frame. I guess that's fine. And we just need to store that. So we do have a behavior uh, macro for this. We need to find where it is. Do you remember what it was? So set static memory index value. If the value is null, then we use whatever's in the accumulator. Okay, so I don't need to do that. I can just do this instead. Um, like so, and we're going to set walk frame to zero. So we're just resetting. <laughs> we're, we're creating this value called walk frame and we're setting it to zero to, to begin with. <coughs> on a Wi-Fi around me, I always have to adjust what channel is. This is why you need 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi is much, much better. If, you, if your router can handle it, definitely use that. Uh, there's a lot less channel collision. Um, it's what I'm using. So my 5G is actually uh, going through uh, one of those Netgear Nighthawk routers because it has a, a dual 5 gigahertz channel. So um, it will output on two different uh, channels. On the five gigahertz so even if one starts getting collision you've got to fall back to the other one as well <clears throat> and plus it's a really good range extender for the wi-fi and there's no way my computer would pick up the, the 5g otherwise <coughs> yeah five gigahertz collide but there's a lot less collision because there's a lot more bands so all right i'm going to top my wine up so i've typed one line of code and already i'm on my second glass of wine Cool, right, so yeah, this enemy is going to use this this warp frame. Um, this is probably going to be fairly standard. Um, I, I think a lot of these behaviors will kind of be copied between enemies. Um, but we'll, we'll try and kind of turn as much of them as possible into macros uh, when we reuse them so that we're, we're only changing code in this one place rather than keep rewriting it all the time. Um, but for now, we'll we'll just we'll keep going, and until we um, I'm behind a couple of streams of wine, yeah. Isn't five gigahertz like a microwave oven? No, the, the this is the problem with two point four gigahertz um, uh, Wi-Fi is that it is close to the microwave oven uh, frequency, so that's why um, if you use a microwave while you're using two point four gigahertz Wi-Fi, it can drop out quite quickly. So. It's another good advantage to 5 gigahertz. But of course, nothing beats a proper LAN cable, so uh, that's why I want to get Ethernet at some point in here. Okay, so nice and simple. We're, we're setting this warp frame to 1. We need to create a little table in here. Um, for, for tables that are related to individual behaviors, I like to keep them inside here. We do have a tables file, but it's pointless kind of putting that in there because it's kind of behavior related. You've got to remember with the way we've set these behaviors up as well, that these have, these jumps have to be the first things in here. After the jumps, you can put what you want, um, but the jumps have to be the first bytes in here. You can put labels in, that's fine. Uh, in fact, just to, to make it neat, I'm going to put the label after there as well. Um, um, but the first bytes within in an enemy behavior have to be those jumps there. They're basically, this is a true vector. So this is, um, actually, no, it's not a true vector because there's a jump instruction. Oh. oh what's going on there? Wow, okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced by this internet so far. It's, uh, what's that? Uh. Okay, so the f we're going to create a little table. I can't type in it now. What is going on? Right, that's, that's... Okay. I wonder if that's the connection. Okay, right. Uh, 
Is it back? No, it's not back. <sighs> okay, so that's... Did everyone else get a drop out then as well? I definitely got a drop out. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to um Actually no, I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna leave it another I'm gonna leave it another half an hour. Um if we're still getting problems then I will switch over to the other um internet. I still have both of them active at the moment. Um until I can get on a on a LAN cable. It's a shame because in and everything else I've done with it, it's been really good, so... Okay, I've switched over to I switched over to Sky um, for now. Um, let me just double check that. What is going on? I'm switched on to Sky. I'll, I'll try and bridge the. Oh my god, it's gone again. Sorry, guys. Should have maybe done some test streaming before this. Okay, I'm on Sky now. I don't know why it keeps dropping out. I think it might be the Wi-Fi on my computer. I think it is that aerial. <sighs> okay, right. Okay, it's it's switched over to Sky now, so we'll we'll see how it goes. If I'm still getting problems, then we we can rule out that it being anything to do with the uh, the 5G. But it's not looking good so far. Sorry about that guys. Right, let's continue then. So we're going to add a table in here and this is going to be um, for our walk frames. Uh, so walk left and walk right. Um, as usual we'll use the, the double underscore uh, label at the end so we can grab the length of that. Now I need to go and find out what frames they are. Uh, did I load them in separately? I believed I loaded them in separately, didn't I? Let's have a look. Looks like I did, so where's my actual load? It's in maps, isn't it still? There we go. Okay, so... Enemy sprites stop in at C400 starting at frame 16. Okay, which is that one there? So let me. Oh, what was that? I heard something. Oh, thank you for the sub resub, Amok. Three months in a row. Very good. Very much appreciate it. Three months of bad connection and lots of wine. And it's that one, isn't it? Did I save it out as a separate file? Oh, no, I'm going to import because I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't be sure what I actually did, so. Uh, enemy sprites, there we go. Oh, yeah, it was that one. Okay, so we've got 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and then 21 onwards for the other one. Okay. 
So what left is 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then right is 21, 22, 22, 24, 25, like so. <laughs> C64, yes, C64 indeed. Welcome to the stream, Big Wee Wee. Big Wee Wee 420. Uh, okay, so we're going to create two tables for these. Our warp frame is in here. Um, so basically, on an update, we're, we're just going to increment this warp frame. We'll do that constantly on each frame um, for now. At the beginning, we, we just we won't care about whether or not we need to update or anything. Um, actually, no, we should only do it if we're not falling. Because if we're falling, if we're falling, we don't want to do the walk animation. So let's do it here. Because at this point here, we know we're not falling, so we need to do one of the two. So, do walk animation. And so we will... So that's... Uh, I think that just loads to the accumulator. Let me just double check. Yeah, loads to the accumulator. Okay, so... Uh, we need to keep X as it is, so we'll transfer this to Y register. It's just easier to deal with increments with the Y. Two bytes uh, versus more for a clear and an add. Oh, hi, Akmafil. I didn't see you come in. You have been typing. I guess it was while all the, all the connection was going. Yeah, coding the enemy AI at the moment, if you can call it AI. A bit. Yeah, in a minute, in a minute. Let's get the get the warp frames working, and then and then we'll commit. Um, so the only other thing we need to do is we need to compare y with, um, and it doesn't matter which of these uh, warp frames we use because they're both going to be the same length. Um, but we just need the length. Can transfer that back to the accumulator. Cool. So this is grabbing the um, grabbing the contents of here. Actually, would it make sense to let's have a look? One, so two cycles, two cycles, two cycles, and three bytes versus two cycles. I think. I think an add is just two as well. Uh, let me just check that. I think it's two, so. Yeah, yeah. Um. Ah, uh, the media is two, yeah. Okay, so maybe it is worth doing it like this instead. Because then we get rid of that. Same number of same number of bytes. Uh one less cycle. Two less cycles, sorry. <laughs> uh okay, so yeah. Oh, thanks for the host, Dom. Welcome to the stream, buddy. Okay, so, yep, that should be enough. And we set the static when we use null here because if we've already got it in the accumulator, we set our behavior up. Um, let's just go over that again. So we set our behavior up so that if you pass in null as a value, um, it doesn't bother loading the accumulator with, with this. It, it just uses what's already in the accumulator. Oh, good. <laughs> and it's got wine again. We're, we're, we're wine enabled again. I had some teething troubles with the with the new internet, so I've had to switch back to the old internet for now. Um, which, while it may not have the, the uptime of the new internet, is, is a little bit better, I think, for, for streaming. Uh, oh, welcome to the stream, Tim Bode. Bo 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 
I'll call you Tim. Welcome to the stream, Tim. Um, and Turtles. <laughs> yeah, Skynet is back. I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced if I move the 5G router in here and connect it up to the up to the computer with um with an Ethernet cable, I won't have the problem. It is it is probably because my Wi-Fi has no aerial in it and it's supposed to have a big old aerial stuck in it, so. And I'm guessing that the Sky Wi-Fi is stronger or something. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll try again sometime. I'll try each week. I'll try again. I'll try something else to to enable it and, uh, and try again. Hey, Gunstar. Welcome to the stream. And thank you for the follow, Tim. Very much appreciated. Yeah, it's Huawei trying to steal all, yeah, all my uh, all my streams. Yeah, the router is a Huawei router as well, so um, they they really do have their fingers in the um, in the five G pie. Okay, so uh, we should set the enemy frame, I guess, at this point as well. So um, not on the on spawn on here. Uh, Hopefully we've done the same with the enemy frame where we can just pass in a empty yeah this frame not equals zero. Uh, I should just put or frame. Uh, sorry and frame. So so we can do the same in here as well. So if I do set enemy frame zero or I do set enemy frame null, it will just use the value that's in the accumulator, which is our walk frame. Um, actually, no, that's not correct, is it? Because this this is just zero to four. Um, we actually need to do this down here. So this is walk left, update position. This is walk right. So we'll do it in uh, straight after the update position. So we need to set the enemy frame there. And the way we're going to do this is... Uh, most of what's in your room is made in China. You, you know what? You're right, actually. I reckon I reckon about 99% of what you see behind me is made in China. So... Um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Chinese source database, yeah. Oh, Gunstar, you'll have to show me how you did that, because I, to be honest, I've not even had my Turbo Chameleon plugged in for, for a, a couple of months, because uh, I've been I've been busy doing other stuff, and I've been doing it all through Vice, um, but I never got around to, to actually putting any of the cores on it, so it'd be good to um, good to, to work out how, how you do that, so I'll give it a try, and if I get stuck, I might, I might um, shout for your help on that. Um... I think the scary thing with uh, the 5G is the fact that they have to put those small cells so close together. Um, I think it's 500 meters maximum between them. Um, so you have your kind of major base station and then you have lots of uh, small cells to, to give you the signal every 500 meters. And that kind of means that there's, there's a little kind of radio transmitter owned by Huawei every 500 meters. So, so it's, that's the scary thing about it, I think. Um, if they wanted to, to do crazy stuff, then yeah. Yeah, with 60, everyone will need. They're going to have to. I mean, it's it's crazy how, how close they have to be at the moment. Like I say, I can see mine over the road. It's literally just over the road on the, on the lamppost, so. Um, okay, so we need to we need to set this enemy frame, so it's not going to just be what's in the accumulator. What we need to do is we need to we need to grab this value again from memory. And we'll transfer it to the Y register. We're walking left, so we'll load the accumulator with walk left, comma Y, and then set the enemy frame. That should be enough. Um, so that's... Well, actually, I'm going to leave a little bit of a gap just so you can see what's going on. And then we need to do the same on walk right. So we do the same here. And it's just with walk right. So I think what's going to happen here is it's going to, it's going to be too fast. So we may use, need to use our timer to make sure this only happens once every other frame or so. so. Oh, 
Hi Reggae Pirate, welcome to the stream. Good to see you again. Alright, let's give that a try and see what happens. Well, it's compiled alright, so that's a good start. Okay, so it's working, it's just a little bit fast. So that's fine. So, um, if I remember rightly, we do have um, a timer exactly for this. There we go, Z ZP counter. So this, this ZP counter updates every frame um, without fail. So what we can do, um, if we just put a branch in here, like skip or something like that, and then we can um, load, <coughs> load the ZP counter. And if we end it with 03, and then if it's not zero, we we'll branch to skip. So now it'll update only once every four frames. Should be a lot more, a lot more uh, accurate in terms of what we want, I think. There we go, that's kind of cool, I think. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So now we've got <clears throat> we've got that working properly. So let's have a think now. Um, it would be nice to have. Maybe this can be the simple behaviour. Um, um, just for testing, we'll du duplicate it. Um, so that it can jump up onto platforms as well because at the moment that's not really a challenge is it i mean this is this is going to be quite an easy easy enemy to dispatch um but if you have an enemy that that will well i would have died there anyway but if you have an enemy that can also jump up platforms that would be that would be kind of good so <clears throat> um okay oh damn we can't, can't quite jump that platform it's just a little bit too far Oh, yeah, you can. Awesome. <clears throat> cool. Um, one thing we don't have is a stun animation. So maybe we, we can put a stun animation at some point. It would actually be good if we could start getting these um, these enemies to be hit by these, these things. Um, so you can stun them. Um, because I want it so that if you hold down the space bar, uh, well, hold down the fire button, sorry, um, <clears throat> you'll do the mouth open animation. Um, and then if there's any stunned enemies within a certain range of you, you will absorb them in. Um, so we'll probably look at that. We might even manage that on this stream if I stop chatting away. How many frames do I want in the stun? I don't know. So. It depends what what we want the stun to be. Do we want it to be a general effect across all enemies, so it's easily recognisable? So, for instance, in um, <clears throat> in Parasol Stars, Bubble Bobble, um, I'm not sure about Rainbow Islands, um, but the the enemies basically all go one colour. Uh, I think it's green, like a light green colour. Um, and then they rotate as well, so it's just the same same sprite, like static sprite, but just in four locations. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I mean, just try something. Let's try something. I I, I guess we need to make sure that the um, the stun animation is easily recognizable so no matter what the enemy is you should be able to tell it's stunned so there should be a kind of a common uh, a common look between them all um so you can tell um you can tell which one you know uh yeah you can you you can recognize what that they've done down sorry my brain went to other places then um, <clears throat> I need more wine. That's what it is. So we're we're not even on the first break yet, and I'm already halfway through that ball. So it's all good. Wait for this moment for two weeks. Um, 
yeah, I, I we just need to figure out what to do. Um, I think a color change would be the obvious thing. Um, at the very least, we can change the color to something that's not used by any other enemy sprite, like a gray or something. Um, and then it's just what do we do to to make it obvious that it is also it's in stun other than just color. Um, more code, less wine. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, um... Oh, it's a good point actually, we do have... We do have, um, other effects going on as well, so if we've got a... If we've got a freeze on the floor... Or you hit an enemy with a freeze ball sort of thing, then... Will they change colour then as well, or or is just the, the colour of the floor going to be enough? Um... Okay, let's not worry too much about the stun for now. Let, let's have a go at doing another behavior as well. So um, so this guy up here is just a, a, another enemy at the moment. Um, so let's let's make a behavior for him. So let, let's copy let's copy this enemy here. Um, so the behavior is almost the same uh, and then we'll enhance it a little bit as well. So Let's just go in here. We've already got an enemy behavior one up there, so I'm just going to copy the contents of this one. And I'm going to make it enemy behavior one. Like so. And hopefully now when I run that, we should get two of these enemies doing the same things. Um, but we're going to change... We're going to change the first one. <laughs> Interesting, the color's different. Oh, that's something we haven't actually set in here, so we should probably do that. Um, do we have enemy score, enemy type, enemy frame? Uh, do we put enemy color in here? I guess we should put enemy color in here because we may want to. We wait. We wait. Yeah, we may want to do different things with the colors. Um, so I'm going to put enemy color in there, uh, and then I'm going to. Not in that one, in... Oh yeah, in this one actually. Set enemy frame. We're going to set enemy colour in here. So we'll copy that set enemy frame. We'll call it set enemy colour. What this lets us do as well is if we wanted to do the, the old creature's trick of flickering very quickly between two colours, we can do this as part of um, the behaviour as well. So we can just have a toggle in the behaviour. Um, so very easily you can start in, in fact we should probably do that actually in fact I, I will do that now so I can show you that uh, effect um, and you'll be able to see an easy way to create create extra colors and I'll show you how to pick those colors as well uh, so okay let's set this up so basically this is all the same as the enemy frame but instead of enemies the enemy f wait a minute so enemy color Enemy, yep, enemy color like that, and then when we draw the enemies, can't even remember where the enemies are being drawn now. Let's have a look in here, it must be in here somewhere. Update enemies, enemy position, enemy state, enemy type, now that's spawn. Uh, somewhere in here there's got to be a draw. Where are we actually doing that? Let's have a look in the start routine. So, update enemies. So you'd think it would be in here somewhere, which is this one. Call behavior. Oh, come on, this it is in the behavior itself. Let's have a look. Position enemy, I bet it's that one. This is what you get for writing code when you're high on freaking sedatives. Uh, position enemy. Okay, yeah, this is set in. It's also set in the enemy frame, so let's do it in here. I think that makes sense. Should probably be a bit more than position enemy, but. Let's do it. That's that. Okay, so enemy color. 
Uh, actually, do we have a label for that? Let's have a look. B027. There you go. Sprite color zero. Uh, where's it gone again? Behaviors. No, not behaviors. Macros. There we go. Don't really need to do zero plus three. You can just do three. There's a. Uh, you know, our enemy sprite starts at sprite 3, uh, we've got player at, um, 0 and 1, and the crown will probably be at sprite 2, and then we've got sprite 3 onwards. We can probably start looking at the, the crown at some point soon as well, because that would be kind of cool to get that in. Um, but let's let's get the enemy behaviour in first for this second one, we'll get the colour work in. We'll do a colour flicker between two so you can see how uh, colour mixing works on that, that side. <laughs> Hi, Shala. Uh, hello, Shala. I'm saying hello to myself. Vittorio Becci. Oh, welcome to the stream, Vittorio. Um, and you're welcome. Nice to, nice to meet you as well. A real programming channel on Twitch. Well, it's Commodore 64. I mean, it's kind of outdated, but it's the best programming language out there, in my opinion. Simple to learn and, and just full of fun. Right, okay. Let's get that go in let's just make sure that our colors are working so we've got that in place we're just going to need to add in our behavior um, in here on the on spawn so this is enemy behavior one so we'll just try to see that our colors are working so we'll set color let's go for purple for um, the first enemy and for the second enemy we'll do uh, well, we had yellow, didn't we? So let's let's set uh, enemy color yellow on that one, just to make sure it's working. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Cool. Right. So what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to show you how we can use um, use this ZP counter here um, to, to do a color flicker between the two. So we'll just do it on, on our second enemy. So the enemy that we had at the bottom of the screen, so let's start up again. Um, the enemy that we have down here, we're going to flicker the yellow between two colors. So first of all, I'm going to find this article. Um, not that one. That's me looking for PlayStation games. This one. Um, so, so I'll post this article link in chat. I'm, I'm sure I've posted this before, but it's a really good article because one thing it does have in it is, when I get to it, is this thing, which is a really good color mixing um, tester. Uh, so it shows you the, the, the two colors um, that you're going to be mixing and then when you click them they flicker really quickly uh, and you'll see in fact it's more obvious on stream um, on the on the stream video that some of them flicker less than others uh, so I'm gonna pick ones that that are different enough um, but don't flicker very much so like this green here is an interesting one because it's it's a green that doesn't exist um, so it's using uh, what's that light green. Oh, God, why have they not put the colours in the right order? That's kind of annoying. So it's using green uh, and actually we'll do this one, this blue here. So it's using green and light blue. So let's go for green and light blue. Let's try that out. Uh, let's call it colour toggle and we create a little table in here. Um, with two numbers in it. So green, which is five, and light blue, which is 14. Uh, and then we need to do this set enemy color. So we will do this every frame, because regardless if we're falling or not, we need to do this every frame. And this needs to be the accumulator. So we'll just set zero, or we'll set null in there, which implies that whatever's in the accumulator will be set as a color. Um, and then we need to grab the ZP counter. We need to end with one. So we just get the last bit of it. So it will either be zero or one. We transfer that to the Y register. 
and then we load color toggle comma y and say there there we go Why is that not stuck? There we go. So at the moment it's yellow and we're going to set it to this flickery kind of blue colour. There you go. So we're probably not going to keep that. Um, I just want to demonstrate how it works. And you can see how, how easy it is to, to implement. And you can use this site to kind of to pick the colours uh, quite easily. As you can see, there's there's a lot of that are very very flickery. There's some that are very stable. Uh, so the green we the the blue we used here is quite stable. Um, it's hard to tell on an emulator. It's hard to tell uh, on stream as well. In fact, it's worse on stream because the stream uh, frame rate uh, doesn't match quite. The frame rate in the uh, emulator is 50 frames a second, but the screen refresh rate is different. And actually the refresh rate on a PAL machine is not quite 50. I think it's like 49.97 or something like that. It's not, it's not exactly 50. Um, so you only get the effect properly on a real machine. Um, but you can, yeah, I mean, you can tell from that it, it is a slightly different color that doesn't exist, so. You can see it's working. Right, I'm going to take a two minute break to have a quick cigarette. Um, three glasses are whitening already, I'm quite impressed. Um, and then we'll we'll update this behavior for this, this purple guy up here um, to do to do a jump basically. We'll, we'll get him we'll get him down here on this this platform and we'll have him jump up onto here if there's a player in range. So, if, or, or if he's below a player, um, we'll get him to jump up. Now, that's gonna be a bit tricky because if you've got a player here and you've got a player here, which one is his player of interest? He, he can't get to this one, so he needs to know that he can't get to this one. Um, but he could walk off the edges as well. So we need to think about that. So. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to have a little think about how we're going to do that behavior. It may be that we, we leave that behavior for now and move on to something else. We'll maybe do a flying, randomly flying one. Um, we only have one enemy sprite, so there's not really a lot we can do with it just yet. Um, but yeah, I'll take a break. I'll have a think what to do next, uh, and I'll be right back. Be right back, guys. That's a very quick one because it's freezing outside and miserable and wet. It's horrible. What I thought I'd do first is I'm going to make this color um, flicker uh, an extension of our set color macro. Um, and then we'll do a, a different behavior. So rather than having jump up platforms, which is going to be a bit more complicated, and I need to think about how to do that properly. Um, we'll, we'll do one that kind of flies around the level instead and just kind of bounces off things. Um, so let's, let's start by changing this. So I'm going to change this so that now we'll be able to pass in, um, either that, which will just set the value in the accumulator, or you'll be able to pass in two numbers like so, and it will do this code. Actually, that should be 14. 14, there we go. Which means this is needs to be null here. So just need to check anytime we set the enemy colour, we need to be using two values. Um, so in the spawn, so spawn and then a spawn up here as well. Where's the spawn gone? There it is. And then our behaviour, we'll just enhance the behaviour a little bit to do two things. Okay, so this is the code we want to run um, if color two is set. So if color two is not null, then we'll do this block of code, um, which I'm going to change in a second. Otherwise, do this. Can I do else if 
really. I can't do Elsif. Okay, fine. I'm sure you can do Elsif, but for now I'll just do it like this. It's fine. Um, we don't have a table anymore. Um, I'm going to remove that table from in here. Remove this table. And it's 5.14, not 4.14. If it's zero, it will come to here. Uh, yes, think about this. Yep. Okay, so load accumulator with color. Otherwise, we need to load the accumulator with color two. And we'll put skip in there. A jump to skip. I'm not keen on using jump to skip here. Because um, jump is six cycles, whereas a branch is three if the branch is taken. Um, actually, whatever. It's fine. If we need to optimize this, we can optimize it. I'm sure we won't need to. Let's give that a run. So it should do exactly the same thing, but um, now it's been done as part of a macro. There we go. Cool. So now we can use that everywhere. So if we wanted to make the other guy flicker, we can just use some very simple uh, code to do that um, in our behaviors. So in behavior one up here, uh, we can do set enemy color, and um, we could pick two two new values in here. Um, let's pick something that's fairly stable like that one. There we go. Cyan and which grey is that? That's the light grey. I can never remember which number light grey is. I think it's 11. Uh, so uh, cyan is 3, 11 is light grey. So let's try that. No, we didn't actually, Andy. That's a very good point. So, we, oh no, that's that's ooh, that looks weird. Let's pick a different different one. How's about that one? So, blue, light blue, and light grey. Okay. Um, oh, out of interest, you can actually use that as well. So kick does have these color um, things built in as well. So if you if you can't remember the numbers, you can just use the the values for them, uh, the the constant values for them instead. Yeah, there we go. I mean, they look a bit flickery, but as I say, they they look a lot better on the real machine. Um, and I, I don't intend on, on using this very much. We may use it for the odd enemy here and there. Um, I just wanted to demonstrate how, how you would go about doing something like this. So for now, I'll keep that top one as yellow. We'll keep the bottom one flickery. We'll keep the, the bottom one as yellow. In fact, we only need to do it once. We'll do it there. Don't need to do it on the on update once it's spawned. Will they look like they are on the website on real hardware? They will look a lot closer to the website on real hardware, yeah. The other problem as well is Vice has got so many different palettes. Um, I find it difficult to find the right palette. And again, this palette might not be exactly right as well. So it's a case of experimenting on real hardware when you're doing these things. This was more about showing how you would do this effect. So it's a really simple effect to do, um, but quite quite effective. Okay, let's do a snap enemy uh, routine as well. Oh, thank you for the follow, Ca Cassiodorus. I'll call you Cassio. Thank you for the follow, Cassio. Oh, and thank you for the host as well, Dr. Miz. I missed that one. Okay, so 
we already had a snap routine for the player. Um, basically, any time that the the enemy, the, the player is not falling, so any time he's on solid ground, um, we will we will take his value um, and we will round it to the nearest eight bytes. Um, eight, yeah, the nearest eight basically, uh, so that he fits on a Commitosaurus. Yeah, that's a very good point. I will commit now. That's a good point. Do a commit. Um, now it's not as obvious. Oh, I've got another two pulls for Dot Cosmos. I've been doing. Uh, actually, I'm not going to tell you what I've been doing because it's it's kind of a surprise. I'm going to post a video in the next week or two. So I'm using Dvorak layout while co. Oh no, not at all. Standard QWERTY. Standard QWERTY. Um, and howdy as well, Master Buster. Welcome to the stream. I've I've tried to use the uh, the fancy the keyboard layouts and I I can't do it. I've I've been doing it so much. Um, so much with QWERTY for years and years, I just can't switch. I realise if you you spent a day or two practicing, you'd soon pick it up, but I I, can't, I just can't do it, unfortunately. Uh, do I have a page with the tools I use? No, I don't. I do need to get a, a tools macro, but I'm I'm using a Sublime Text three um, with the Kick Assembler plugin. Um, that's pretty much it, really. Um, if you join my Discord, um, I do have some links um, in the links and resources channel. If you look at the pinned pinned messages in there, um, there's a lot of links to to setting up the environment in the way that I've got it set up with Vice and um, Sublime and Kick Assembler. And also, it's uh, the Discord's a good channel to to be in just because there's a lot of really helpful people on there. So if you're ever stuck getting something set up, there's always somebody there who can help you get it get it going. Um, okay, cool. We're three quarters of the way through this wine bottle now. I've got to say, I'm missing the taste of this. It's delicious. Ah, it's beautiful. Um... Okay, right, so let's have a look. What was I going to do? Oh, yes, yeah, snap the player. Okay, so we'll we'll create a new macro in here. Um, stick it down the bottom. And we'll call it uh, snap enemy to floor. So we, we want to um, round the the character's Y position to the floor. So one way we can do this um, is we can grab the enemy's Y position. So it's this bit here, this, is it this one? Yeah. Um, and, and basically round it. So you could just do that and that would, that would round that value uh, to the nearest eight. However, that's not going to work, and I'll show you. I'll show you what happens if we try and do that, and then I'll explain why it doesn't work. Um, so let's have a look. Let's do it in enemy one for now, and we can do it on the other enemy if we need to. Um, so if we're falling, we don't do it. So we would do it as part of this this bit here. So snap enemy to floor. And you'll see what happens when we run this. And you see it's still it's still within the platform slightly. Um, and if I go and do it on this one down here as well. So I go and do it on enemy two. Because we do need to snap both of them, so we may as well do it on, on enemy two as well. Oh, 
<laughs> That's annoying, it is actually snapping it to the floor. What have I done wrong? Oh, because I need to do that. Got to remember that these macros always need to use index with X because it's not just about setting one value, it's about setting multiple values in the enemy kind of data structure. Um, and the, the, very, the, the exact one we need to set is stored in the X register always. It should still be wrong though. Hopefully it's wrong, or else this is going to be very frustrating because it's going to it's going to look correct, and I know it's not. So yeah, there we go. So you can see the problem here now that this this enemy is actually being uh, rounded, snapping to a value which is eight pixels above the floor. It's actually probably not eight pixels. It's probably six pixels. Um, and the reason for that is because what's happening is um, even though we're, we're rounding it to the nearest eight pixels, the the floor itself isn't on one of those eight pixel boundaries. It's in, it's in a slightly different place. And you will see that in the player uh, routine. Uh, it's player, there we go. Let's find draw. Uh, actually, let's just look for the word snap. It's gonna be in there somewhere, surely. No, it's not brilliant. Okay. Uh, okay, let's find uh, F8. There we go. So this is a routine that actually snaps the player. So what it does is it subtracts six from the position and then it rounds it. And then it sets the six back again. And that's because the floor is not on an eight boundary. It's on a six pixel boundary instead, just because of the, the way that the sprites start it off screen they start at the top of the screen at zero in the border um, and by the time they get to the screen it's the the screen is actually at 50 i think um so that's not a round value in terms of you know uh, eight eight bit uh, eight byte boundary eight pixel boundaries um so by doing this we ensure that we we first of all we remove that excess um uh, the, the excess pixels then we do the round and then we put the excess pixels back again. So we're just going to copy that and we're going to do basically the same thing in our, in our enemy macro. So instead of just doing this, instead we will, oops, instead we will do the whole thing. And we should see now that when we run that, the, the enemies do indeed snap to the floor properly. Yeah, there we go. Is there a good reason why not move the grid to the right place instead of snapping everything? Um, yeah, I mean, this could be done in the draw routine as well, um, which is, is kind of what's happening in here. Um, in fact, no, it's not happening in here. So you could do it in the draw routine. Um, but to be honest, it, it's, it's much of a muchness. It's going to be the same wherever you do it. Um, I like to keep... If, if a sprite says it's at zero, 00, I want it to be at zero, 00. I don't want zero, 00 to mean actually it's going to be drawn at minus 2, comma 1, because then you get into all sorts of weird boundary problems when you, you start moving things up and down. So um, I, I like the, 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 the sprite positions in the VIC registers to match the sprite positions that we store for the sprites. Um, you know, for enemies and players and things like that. And if they do need to move, we can just do it as part of the, the update routine. It's not a huge amount of uh, cycles that to, to do this. I mean, we're looking at what, two, four, six, eight, um, plus a load and a store. So it's 13 cycles. You know, you can do that five times in a line. Um, and that's fine. And you might not want to always snap things as well. So with, if you start trying to snap as part of the sprite draw routine then you're always going to be snapping you can't snap selectively and we need to snap selectively so if a if an enemy is falling we don't want it to snap we want it to to be hitting every value between those it, we only want it to snap when it's on the floor um so we're going to do we're going to change this enemy behavior for, for player one for sorry enemy behavior one um to be something completely different in a minute which means I'm going to remove all of this code pretty much. Um, and that's going to fly around the level. And, and in that case, we don't want any snapping whatsoever. So 
Hi Mads, welcome to the stream. Hope you're doing well. So yeah, it's just because the, the sprite coordinate system um, for the very first pixel of a sprite that you will see on screen at the very top, the very first row of pixels, visible pixels that aren't inside the border are not on uh, an eight pixel boundary within the sprite space. They're actually two pixels out. So you have to do this kind of subtract six and then add it back in again. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a pain, um, but it, it's not too bad. The The downside of doing it like this, so, so another way to do this is when you do the actual fall routine, is you work out as it's falling. Actually, if I move this car if I move this sprite to this new location, he's going to be in the floor by two pixels. So actually, don't move him four pixels down; just move him two pixels down. Um, the downside of that is that you have to do extra um, extra calculations as part of your fall routine. Um, the upside of that is that the the snap to the floor is instant. The snap to the floor with this method will always be delayed by one frame. So you will get one frame where um, the enemy is two pixels into the floor. Um, and then on the very next frame, it will snap back up again. Um, I, I prefer that method because I think it makes the code less complicated. If you start adding lots of um, checks to falls and, and, and stuff, then it, it gets kind of kind of gets messy and uh, you don't really want it to be, be that messy. And I think one frame i mean we're talking 20 milliseconds of seeing that that character in the wrong place um you're not going to notice it i mean you don't notice it in in this really you'd have to be you'd have to be watching it on very in fact let me put it on slow-mo and you'll see what i mean so um it's probably going to take ages to load now because it's running at 10 percent of the speed but you'll see as the character falls, it, there's one frame where it just just kind of gets inside the, the background and then it corrects itself. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Old hardware does have some very funny properties. So you'll probably see... Actually, no, this guy falls exactly on the floor but you didn't even see it there when this guy snapped and that's probably because he was already in the floor when the raster was past him so by the time he'd snapped it had already it had already happened it's it's not going to happen that often um and you're certainly not going to see it um that easily so it's, it's kind of fine i think um, I've certainly used it like that in everything I've done so far and it's never it's never been a problem and it's hard for it's hard for people to to really notice it. I've never never had anyone go. Oh, wait a minute, that was halfway in the in the platform. Um, in fact, the only time that happens is when I actually get the collision wrong, and there is a way of getting stuck in a platform. Which, by the way, does happen in Dot Cosmos One. So if you if you jump uh, diagonally down towards a platform there's a chance you can get stuck one character well not stuck but you can you can land one character inside a platform um, because the check happens down and to the right it doesn't happen diagonally uh, down and to the left sorry doesn't happen diagonally um, so if you're you're landing at just the right falling at just the right speed and diagonally and on the corner of an object you can actually land just inside the, the corner here um, you can probably do it on these guys as well, actually. Um, although the collision system we're using in this is slightly better than was used in Dock 1. Because uh, in Dock 1 I didn't use collision points, I just used collision characters. Um, so I just checked to the left, I checked to the right, and that's it. I didn't check like where my foot was or where my, my head was, um, like we do on this one. So um, Okay, cool, so they're snapping to the floor now. Um, and again, this is the beauty of this macro system. Uh, you've got to remember, macros is is a is a kind of a payoff. There's a there's a kind of balance between um, code reuse that isn't really that isn't like a subroutine. There's every time we use one of these macros, this code is copy pasted into is straight into where we use the macro. So this this whole thing here, every time we do an update position, this gets pasted 
into the location where it says update position. Now because we're using ifs, only one of these blocks is actually going to, well no at most two. Most two of these, one for the y pos and one for the x pos is going to get pasted into that location. Um, but this is code that could have been done using a, a jump to subroutine instead. Um, but I just like doing it with the with the macros. I, I find it more useful because you can pass parameters in and uh, jumping to subroutines is not uh, not not that kind of great to be honest in, in, in this situation. You could probably combine the macros and the jump to subroutines. You could probably have the macro here and then this would be uh, a subroutine somewhere else that you could jump to. But I, I, I'm fine with this. Um, I don't think this game is going to struggle to get into 16k. In fact, we can see how far it's going to get now. I think we have Xmiser built in here. Mm, do we? No, we don't. All right. Um, we should probably do that at some point, actually, get the pipeline set up. So I think, actually, I'm going to make a note of that on the next stream. Um, we'll set up the um, the compression pipeline as well. Um so we can actually start seeing just how much memory this takes up. Um, whenever we do a build, it will build uh, the normal output, but then it will also run a little script which will build the um, compressed output. So this one here, this out.prg is a compressed output. Um, if I just start Vice, we can see where it is. I think it was only like a stream or two behind. It wasn't far behind at all. Um, Let's have a look. Oh, there we go. So you can see it's got the little decompression routine in there. Yeah, see it wasn't far behind. It was like one one stream behind. We hadn't got the behaviors in um, fully yet. We hadn't got the gummy bear in, but we, we definitely had uh, the start of the behaviors. And this is 5,231 bytes. Um, whereas if you look at the actual output from the game um, without the compression which is this one which is the one we've been working on today you'll see that that is actually 61,000 bytes I mean a lot of that is blank space uh, because the the PRG will just it will take your your first address with anything you've changed and the last address and just store the whole thing even if you you've got a whole block in the middle that you haven't changed it will just store a load of zeros there um, which is why it compresses so well but this is you know this is taking up technically 61 kilobytes of memory and yet we can compress it down to five um, and you can see here what we're taking up if you look at the memory map output you can see roughly what we're taking up I mean we're looking at you know we're going from 0800 up to 2200 or something uh, so it's quite it's quite a bit already, but it's it's not 61k, but there's it's quite a bit. I mean, we're looking at eight and twelve, maybe 16 to 20k or so. I mean, that's a rough guess. My my head can't do this kind of maths that quick in in hexadecimal after almost a full bottle of wine. We were looking at about 20k's worth of uh, of stuff. And as you'll see, when we get towards the end of this project um, and we we start pushing towards that 16k limit, there's a lot of things we can do to reduce that down. So even though this is 20k, one of the things that does happen when we load it up is the projectiles, as, which are generated, uh, the, the kind of animated thing, is actually generated, it's, it, it starts off as just a couple of uh, characters in the font set um, but it's unpacked in and, and kind of uh, pre-processed into 4k of memory so that's 4k of memory that isn't in the original PRG but gets unpacked into memory at runtime so we'll be doing a lot of things like that to kind of to reduce the initial footprint but to allow us to expand into as much of the 64k as possible hi Colt welcome to the stream hope you're doing well Okay, so let's have a go at doing another behavior. So let's go back to our behaviors. Let's just strip everything back down. Um, let's call this one, uh, we'll just call it anim frame. We are gonna use some kind of animation. 
Um, we'll call this fly animation. So I think it was Furo, wasn't it, that did the um, did the sprites for this. So if you want to do another uh, another sprite for uh, some kind of flying candy monster would be good. Um, I'm not sure what that would be, but if you want to do it, that would be great. Because then that will be the next animation that we um, that we add in, and the, it will make this behaviour. So, cheers if you can do that. Oh, thank you for the sub, Mitsuyama. Uh, welcome to the stream. The new name. It's nice to see new people on here. So, this enemy one behaviour. Let's put some descriptions in here as well, so we've actually got something we can we can look when we, instead of just enemy one, enemy two. Um, so this will be. Uh, flying candy monster uh, bounces off scenery. Um, so this is a, a very simple enemy type. Um, if you've played Dot Cosmos One, you've probably met the annoying little kind of bat things that, um, that everybody hates because they get in the way hugely and cause many, many deaths. Um, Probably the worst enemy in the in the game in terms of um, <laughs> reducing your life count. They're very unpredictable, um, but then actually they're not that unpredictable. If you know how they work, they're not unpredictable at all. Um, well, I'll tell you how they work. They they basically they they have a swoop animation, so they follow a kind of sine curve like that. Um, and if they hit anything, they will bounce off it. So they will bounce off walls left and right. They will also only go down as as high as one dock cosmos off the ground. So if you're stood on the ground, they will never hit you. Um, they will only hit you if you're at the edge of a ledge because they may come up from the side. But if you're stood in the middle of a platform, you can stand there and you'll be perfectly fine. The, the thing will just fly around above you. Um, and that's it really. You just need to remember you're safe if you're in the middle of a ledge. If you're at the edges of a ledge, then you're you're in trouble. Um, and if you're climbing a ladder, you definitely need to leave some <laughs> leave some room. You love them bats; they're annoying. <laughs> I I don't like them either. They're they're very frustrating. Almost every game, yeah. I'm not sure what we're going to do in this game because everything needs to be kind of candy related. So the 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 gummy bears fit they they work well um and I, I, in terms of in terms of the kind of theme they fit very well but i don't know what you would choose i mean that's down to foro foro will come up with something i'm sure um fruit fly or an apple with wings or something an apple with wings and eyes Okay, so this is our very, very simple behavior, and this isn't going to do very much at all. So, in fact, if we start this now, I'm not even sure what we're going to see. Um, I'm guessing we're not going to see very much. Yeah, see, we don't see anything. Uh, and the reason we don't see anything is because, first of all, we don't set an enemy frame. Um, we're not setting any um, positions, or we're not updating any positions. Um, I think the bare minimum we need to do is we need to set a frame... Um, to begin with. So let's just set an enemy frame in here. Oops. Oh, what have I done? I've done to a different fold folder here. Shit. What have I done? There we go. Oh, I just heard thunder. That's not good. Oh no, it was a motorbike. That's alright. I always worry when I hear thunder. I just think everything's going to suddenly blow up. I mean, I know I've got, like, you know, uh, surge surge strips everywhere, but I still worry. It's been a long time actually since anything of mine blew up from from using a, a surge protector, not using a surge protector. Uh, there are gummy gummy Angry Bird candies. Okay, bonbon bats. I like that. <laughs> bonbon bats sounds really cool as well. I, I think it'd be really nice actually if we do give things cool names like that if on the intro screen um, you know you have your normal screen you have your logo you have your text um, then you have another screen with the high scores on or something and then you have another screen that has some of the enemies and the names of them and maybe the scores that they're, they're worth or something um, I like that 
Bon Bon Bats, yeah, Gone Fishing aka Paul, uh, welcome to the stream, uh, good suggestion, Bon Bon Bats is, is great, I like it. And Martin64, welcome to the stream, and hello. Okay, let's see, I think setting an enemy frame should be enough, because I think if we don't set it at zero, and if the enemy frame is zero, we won't see anything, so I think this should be enough to actually see something. It's going to be static, but we're, we're going to see it. Oh, no, we don't see it. Okay, so let's work out why we don't see it. So, set an enemy frame, that's fine. Let's have a look. So, we don't do anything. We set some states, we set a colour, set a frame. And then in the on update, oh, it's because in the update we need to do position enemy. That's it. So the bare minimum we need to draw something on in our behaviours is we need to do a position enemy. I don't even think we need to set enemy frame. Let's try it without. Yeah, there we go. So we do have something. I mean, it's obviously incorrect because there's no enemy frame. So the absolute bare minimum to show something on screen is just to position it. If you want it to actually be the right thing, then you need to set an enemy frame as well. And there we go. We have we have an enemy. Um, so we're going to make this guy fly around the screen. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to do... Hmm, we'll, we'll have him bounce. So if you imagine a ball in breakout, um, it's moving in a direction. If it hits an edge, it's going to bounce and go the, uh, go the other direction. So we need, we need two things. Um, we need... Uh, so let's set static memory. We'll call these... dx so delta x uh, and delta y so this is basically our direction um, this is the value that's going to get added to our x and to our y every frame this is the value that if we hit an edge we negate so if we're moving in the x direction and our x is one then we move in one pixel across all the time. If we hit an edge, then we negate that value, so it becomes minus one. So then we start going the other direction. It's a way we can bounce off or bounce off the edges. So, hi, Orc Tamer, welcome to the stream. This is indeed Commodore 64. Um, well, we're we're on a PC developing for the Commodore 64, so we're using the Vice emulator to do this. Yeah, if you are getting, guys, if you do get um, streaming errors while I'm streaming, let me know. Because I'm trying to work out whether or not it's my internet connection or my Wi-Fi connection to the router that's the problem. Um, and at the moment, I've switched back to the sky because I don't think the 5G is stable enough um, with the location that it's in. Um, but I also, I had broke my aerial, as I said today, I broke my aerial on my, uh, lost it. I broke, broke the, the pin on my, uh, on my Wi-Fi aerial today. So that should have like a little gold screw cap on the end of it, um, that screws into the back of my computer. Um, but I, I broke that the other day, so, um, a bit. A bit worried about that. You haven't noticed much problems with Sky now. Yeah, that's that's really frustrating. So I'm um, I'm going to do another try again next week. I'm going to do some testing through the week with some um, positioning of the router and maybe get a, a, a LAN cable set up um, because I don't want to stay on Sky. They're absolutely terrible. I mean, the fact that I've spent three or four days out of the past seven without internet with with almost no way to contact them and tell them about it. Um, yeah, where is the best place to report bugs or strange things without disrupting the stream? Um, do you mean with the stream itself, or do you mean you mean game bugs? Um, either way, I mean Discord is probably the best way. If you want to send me a message on Discord, um, I don't always get the chance to to check while we're on on stream. Um, Although, just looking now. Oh, Andy. See, Andy sent me a message an hour ago. Um, is there any way you can let me know that the stream goes down? 
yeah i mean you can send me a private message on um on discord i will maybe see it because i do have the icon down on the bottom of my screen down here uh, so i may see if there is something going on uh i probably need to i probably need to uh, keep an eye on that a bit more uh no i'm not hardwired i've been on wi-fi the whole time um since i started streaming back in uh, may or whenever it was um yeah, I've I've always been on I've always been on uh, Wi-Fi because I have a, I have a very good uh, onboard Wi-Fi on my motherboard, um, but it does require this aerial for it to work properly. So it's got this kind of weird weird dome kind of pyramid aerial thing, um, and it's very good usually. But with now I've broken it, it's actually isn't that great. So. If the internet goes down, Discord breaks too. That's a very good point, Andy. That is a very good point. Although I do have, uh, I do have Discord on my phone as well, which is on, um, which is on a different, um, different network completely. So you can always send it me, um, and I can keep. If I do have problems, I will go to my phone anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, it is never as good as hardware. I do have. Um, what 30 or 40 meter ethernet cable that i can run to the router if i really need to um but i'd rather not because it means i have to kind of leave doors open where i don't want to leave doors open um and I, I i mean i could probably run it under my door maybe i don't know but i'm going to do some testing this week anyway to see what i can do about that so that's 109.3 <laughs> yeah I don't understand that. I, I mean, I'm from England, and I know England has has problems um, switching over to metric at times. Uh, I think the EU is kind of this is one of the good things about the EU, and I mean, I'm very pro EU. But um, one of the things that absolutely is good is that they've made us use the metric system. Um, I, I can't stand the fact that we still have all our our speed limits in miles per hour. It's such an antiquated system. Um, but unfortunately, when I think of distances, I think in miles. I don't think in in kilometers, um, and that frustrates me because I know I know kilometers is the sensible way to think about it. But for some stupid reason, I've been brought up to think about things in miles. Um, you know, I don't think of weights in pounds and ounces. I think of weights in kilograms and grams. Um, yeah, it's just just one of those things. Yeah. At least we don't measure things in fathoms anymore, so. Right, I need more wine. Yeah, one day they will drop it. I, I think, unfortunately, because the Americans um, still use uh, the, the Imperial system for a lot of stuff, and because uh, the Brits absolutely seem to refuse to, to switch to it for... Uh, for cars, for, for 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 distance, basically distance and speed. Um, I I don't think it's going to happen very soon, unfortunately. Um, we're we're stuck in this world where we have to deal with both, and and those those things cost you know cost some companies billions, well millions of pounds. I mean, if you look at um, some of the space program stuff that's that's gone on, there have been errors that have happened because one country has designed something with values in Imperial. And then they've sent it off to another company and they built it with values in metric and it's ended up being wrong and there's you know they've ended up um, sending something out which is broken or it's not done what it's meant to do and yeah there's a there's a lot of examples in life of things like that going wrong okay so oh yeah that's the other thing as well the the um we're, we're kind of getting better at using liquid um in liters and so so you buy a can kind of pop you buy a can of coke or a, a a bottle of coke or a bottle of water it's measured in milliliters but you cannot go into a pub and ask for half a liter of a pint uh, a half a liter of beer it's always a pint so yeah which is weird because i think also the um spirit measures are measured in milliliters not in fluid ounces so i think they used to be fluid ounces but now they're measured in milliliters um well at least in the uk anyway so 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not much though, is it? I mean, I'm I'm perfectly fine. And to be honest, I just have I just have a liter of, of beer then. <laughs> Half a liter of pint. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see. What's the wine measured in? The wine. The wine is measured in centiliters. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. Let's let's do this behavior. So we need we need the dx and the dy, and we need to make them different offsets. So this is static memory locations. Um, these are not values directly for those. So we need to set those static memory locations. So let's set static memory dx. Let's start by setting it to a set value. I think what we'll do next after this is I'll introduce you to um, a technique that I've learned for doing uh, random numbers. I do actually have a random number function up here. I have no idea why it's at the top of this file, but I noticed it earlier that it is up here. Um, I'll enhance this random number thing to show you how. So, so the thing with this random number generator is it generates um, the numbers from zero to two five five in a very pseudo random order. Um, as far as as far as you you know, as far as kind of very simple stuff is concerned it's going to be random uh, but it's the same order every time so once you've gone through all 256 numbers you'll get the same 256 numbers in the same order no number will repeat so you will never it's not truly random because uh, it's not even truly pseudo random um, because you won't get um, say you're picking a number from 0 to 10 you won't get 1 5 7 7 8 you will always get the numbers from 0 to 10 before they repeat um, so I'm going to show you a technique that we can use to make this a little bit more random and allow us to get some kind of um, repetitive numbers as well. It's just going to be an enhancement to this function. There's a little bit of setup we need to do and then there'll be an enhancement that we can do in here. Uh, it's not really top secret. It's something I'm pretty sure every, um, ev every game coder from back in the day would have used. Um, I certainly I've been doing some disassembly of stuff and I've seen it being used in places. Um, but I'll I'll show you what I mean with that. So, um, and it's it's quite simple to do as well. Okay, so we're going to set these values. We're going to set. So we're going to set uh, a positive x and a negative y. So this is going to kind of move to the right and up, which is what we want. Um, and then on an update, we just need to to read those values and set them. So for, for now, we'll just apply those values. And then once we've confirmed that those values are being applied correctly and that the most significant byte of the of the X uh, is, uh, no, it won't use the SID either. It uses uh, CIA timers to do it, so. Um, once we've once we've confirmed that the the most significant byte of the X is working correctly, then we'll start checking the collision using the routines we've got around here. Uh, where was it? We did have a routine in here. There you go. Get enemy collision. So we use the get enemy collision. Um, uh, we we'll use the get enemy collision to work out if it's going to bounce off things and we'll change that where that collision point is based on which direction we're going in. So we we'll use the DX and the DY to pick one of four points. So we're always going to be moving diagonally. So we're going to be moving on with on across. Um, so there'll be four different points that we'll check either the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right corner. And we'll pick one of those. We'll get the collision for that point. And if we hit something in that location, then we'll change the direction. Um, or actually we'll probably do a cross like that so we'll check we'll check if there's anything below us then we'll reverse the y if there's anything at the side of us then we'll reverse the x <laughs> mi5 timers yeah so the the method is is pretty simple it basically sets up two cia timers um with different intervals um and then in this step here where we do the eor um, we also do two additional EORs, so we EOR against CIA1 and then we EOR against CIA2. And that basically gives us two extra flips of all the values based on two timers that are running at different intervals. Um, which means that even though this, this sequence on its own would repeat, it's now time-based as well. So depending on when you do it, you'll get different values. So 
Um, but by keeping the original value in, you ensure that if you were just using CIA timers on their own, you wouldn't just get the same values over and over again. You would use this kind of pseudo random to make sure you get different values. But I'll show you how to do that in a minute. It's really, really simple. So, uh, okay, so we set these values. Then on an update, we are going to grab those values and apply them to X and Y. So let's start by doing the Y. We can test that. And once the Y is working, um, like so, um, once the Y is working, we can do the same with the X because the Y is going to be the simpler one because it doesn't have to deal with the MSB. So let's, uh, do we have update position? We do, there we go. So update position passes in an X and a Y. So actually we don't need to do very much in here. Um, but what we will need to do is probably change this function. So if we don't pass anything into these values, it uses something else. So let's have a look. Uh, so update position, if Xbox, Xpos, not Xbox, if Xpos is zero, more than zero, then do this. Otherwise, why pos do this? But so what we're not doing here is checking if anything is null. So, um, da, 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 let's have a look at, okay. So this is a little bit tricky because we're actually adding the constant value in here. Uh, what we, instead we need to do is we need to add some more complication into this. So this macro is getting quite complicated, but the thing is, is it's only ever going to do a few of these things. It's not going to do all of these things. It's just going to do a couple of these depending on what you pass in. So if xpos equals null, then we're going to assume that, um, well, actually, let's, let's do a check for both. And y pos equals, equals null. Then the values passed in are probably going to be, we'll have accumulator equals x, x update. And we'll have y, we can't use, um, we can't use the x register because that's used throughout here. The x register needs to stay the same all the time. Oh, how funny would it be if they call us, if they call the next Xbox the y box? I mean, they keep throwing a spanner in the works, right? It was the Xbox, the Xbox 360, then the Xbox One. So I fully expect them to do something really stupid. So, so after the CIA, you can then sit it and now the number is mega random. Yep, you could do that as well. That would definitely make it super, super random. God, that would be, yeah, that would be very random indeed, yeah. Um, so this is the thing, we need to do these things here, um, but with these values. So it's just kind of annoying actually, because there's no way to do this through macros. It's not like we can just set this value to, to this uh, that I know of. Next box, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me have a think. I think maybe we do unfortunately need to copy these values. Um, yeah, I think we do, unfortunately. But the difference here, actually, let's let's not let's do it in a different place. I'm not I'm not I'm not fully on board with doing it like this. So um, Because now we're not using the, and now we're not using the um, the lower bytes, the 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 fractional bit of it as well. Okay, I need to think about this. Actually, it's, it's smoke time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to think about this. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to do for I. Um, who am I collecting the values in bin C and values are basically yeah. <laughs> um what I'm trying to do is is call this function, but instead of passing parameters in using registers. So I want to pass in like the accumulator here and the Y register here and have this same thing happen. Um 
so I'm not entirely sure how we can do that. I'll, I'll have a think about it. I'm going to go for a quick smoke because I do need to go to the toilet as well. Um, I will... Yeah, I'll grab the other bottle of wine while I'm while I'm there. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a think about how to do this. Um, basically, I'm trying to avoid repeating this code uh, in in the behavior here. I want it to just be something like this where I can pass in these values. So I want to do something like this, basically. Uh, Translate that to Y. Like that. And then I want to be able to pass null null in here. So it uses the, the Y register and the accumulator um, to update the position. So that that's the aim that we're aiming for. Um, it, it just means that this this macro either needs to duplicate this whole entire block of code, but using the accumulator and the Y register if these are both null, which I think is probably going to be what we're going to have to do. Um, or there needs to be another function which does something different. So, um, all right, cool. Right, I'm going to take five minutes, guys, and I'll be right back. Be right back, guys. All right, I'm back. Um, yeah, so thinking about this, I think we probably are going to have to duplicate this code. Uh, but again, it's a macro, so we're not going to be using... Uh, it's a macro with if statements in it, so we're not going to be using all of this code. Oops, that's the wrong thing. We're gonna, not going to be using this all, all of this code every time we implement this macro. We're only going to be using the code that's relevant depending on the if statements. So it's a whole copy of that block, but then we're going to wrap this whole thing in an if. So uh, if if x pos is null and y pos equals null, then we'll do this block of code. Else we'll do this block of code, which is the original behavior. So it's quite a big piece of code but it just gives us a lot of flexibility in here so we can either pass hard-coded values in or we can use um, we can use the accumulator in the uh, the accumulator and the Y register to do this so the first thing we should probably do is store the Y register somewhere um, hmm. Do we put it in a temp value? I'm going to create a new temp value in the zero page just for this because I'm a bit worried about clashing. We had some clashing problems last time. So I'm going to create a new temp value in here. I'm going to call it temp10. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll do it like that for now. If we get clashed somewhere else, we'll at a later date, we'll know. Okay, so the Y register is stored. So let's. Hang on, I've done that else in the wrong place, haven't I? Yes, I have. X plus, X plus. That else should be down here. Okay, so let's start replacing the X plus code with our new code. Keeping up with the 10 values is key to success, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, thankfully, it's the first thing... I mean, you kind of get used to it. The first thing you check when you, when you get problems is... Um, your push and pulls to the, the stack and then the second thing you check is your your temp values <laughs> okay right um, let's have a look so we're now dealing with the accumulator so we can probably simplify this now um, so we did have some code that did this. I'm trying to remember where the hell that was now. Um, I cannot for the life of me remember where we put it, but we did do some stuff to to do this differently. So let, let's let's think about this. Okay, so this is what we want to do. So let's take it out of there. Um, but what we want to do is we want to... We've already got the accumulator, which is the value of the X pos, which is this bit here. We're not going to bother with the low byte. This is this is not going to be a fractional move at all. We'll simplify it. So if we pass in accumulator and Y register, 
We're not doing fractional because we can't because there are only eight bit values, so we we can only do it here. Um, on on the on on byte one and two, not byte zero. So we've already got the accumulator, so instead we will add that value to the accumulator. Okay, that should work for positive values of the accumulator. Now if it's a negative value, this is going to break. Because the negative value is going to actually be subtracting from this. So what we can do here is we can do compare 80. Um, and then if it's the carry is set, we can jump to the stuff that does the neg. We'll, we'll call it neg in here. We'll call this pos. Even though we won't use this label, it's good just to have it in here anyway. Put skip in here. Look at that jump skip. <laughs> So this needs to do the negative. So the negative is a bit different because now we can't just subtract here. Um, that's not going to work. Or is it going to work? Let me think about that. If we've got... Uh, no, it still needs to be... We, still, we need to... We need to negate the value. So we need to do that. And add one. I'm sure we've done this somewhere, you know. I am absolutely positive we did this. If anybody can remember where we did this on the last stream. That's the one. Yeah, you can avoid the Jubit code by first deck the upper byte if negative. Can you remember where we did that? We did do this on a previous thing. I have a feeling it might be in here somewhere. I do remember doing something like this though, very very recently, so this is it. We decrease the upper byte, then we add, and then we add, yes, okay. Yes, that's that's correct. Okay, right. Well we can do a test, so let's let's uh, let's make this work with just this value first and then we can we can quickly test it out. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of the all the other stuff in here. So we're just dealing with the X value now. <coughs> um, so if it's positive, we'll jump to positive. If it's not positive don't need any of this. Instead, what we need to do is just decrease this value. I think that's it. I think that's all we need to do. Let's give that a try. So, if the X position is positive, then it should. Okay, let's let's do some tests. So, uh, in our enemy behaviors in here. Um, let's, let's just blank that out for now. Let's set the value specifically. So we'll, we'll start by going positive uh, and do nothing on the Y. It doesn't really matter what we do on the Y for now. And just do a test on that, see what happens. Why is that not loading? Oh, because I've already got it open here. Okay. Uh, oh, I've written the word and. Oh my god. Wow. It's been a long time since I did that. That's basic for you. Okay, so that seemed to work and it seemed to go into the MSB, which is what we want. So let's just double check that. I missed it because I was looking. Yep, it's crossing that boundary. Okay, so let's now try negative values on that. Um, so this would be FF. Make sure it goes backwards. And then if it's going backwards, we will make sure that it crosses the MSB, which it is going backwards. 
it's pro where's it gonna go now it's gonna be somewhere weird oh there it is okay the MSB is gonna fail because now it's actually going backwards through the MSB values so it will do this 256 times and then it will suddenly cross over into this value um, so let's set an initial value for that um, so on spawn let's do uh, can we set position in here where are we setting the position I guess it's in here isn't it yeah initialize there we go uh, spawn enemy X so it's this one isn't it yeah so let's set that to 200 Perfect. Yep. Thank you, Sakrek. Thank you for reminding me of that. I knew there was a way to do it because I knew we'd done it on the last stream. Um, and in fact, we'd done it. I can't remember where it was now. It, it was we'd done it somewhere in here, I think. Um, yeah, we'd done it here already. Um, actually, this this block of code could probably be simplified, but I'm not going to do that now because my head's starting to get a bit dizzy I don't want to do some refactoring around that yet uh, but this is a potential refactor so I'm gonna do I'm gonna put to do in here <clears throat> um, yeah so this this is working perfectly for for the value that we want and now we can do the same thing with the uh, the Y value as well so we need to load the accumulator with the value in temp 10 and then we just need to change these to y2 and y1 like so and so now we should be able to also set this value to backwards and this should work correctly uh y2 why is that not present uh okay oh because there is no y2 it's y0 and y1 that's right Oh, in fact, we don't need the upper position. In fact, we don't need to do anything here. We just need to add it. There we go. We don't need any of that stuff in there. That's enough. There we go. Oops. Oh, what have I done? Because we've only got a single byte and we don't care about the lower, the lower fractional value. Um, also, the only thing was set after the load accumulator. Uh, we do need it here, though, because we can't guarantee that when we enter this function, um, that the accumulator will have been the last thing that's loaded. So we do need it here. Uh, but you're right. If we if we'd have done this bit here, we wouldn't have needed it. Um, if the if the Y was uh, the Y was 24 bit as well, but it's not. It's just 16 bit, so it should be fine. Yeah, yeah, it's on it. Yeah, okay, cool. <coughs> and there we go. We've got a sprite that's moving up, and it's it's correctly moving like that. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to uh, obviously we've still got the problem where if it goes off the screen on one side, we're now stuck in kind of high bits over there. So. The reason why it's disappearing here is because actually the high bit is not zero or one. It goes from zero to two five five. So the only time it's ever going to cross this boundary is if it moves from the high bit, the high, the ninth bit. Um, sorry, the upper sixty, the upper eight bits um, is one uh, to zero, and at the moment it's probably like two five zero, two five one or something. So it will do this two hundred and fifty times until it gets down to one, and then it will cross over. But that's fine because we're going to bounce off the edges of the screen um, and off everything else as well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to I want to put it in the middle somewhere, and then I want to change this random function a little bit. So let's do that. Let's uh, find the initial position. So the middle of the screen is um, sprite wise. So the screen is 320 wide, but there's a 24 boundary on one. On one side, pardon me. So the middle of the screen is is 160 plus 24 uh, plus 12. Sorry, so it's 172. That's the middle of the screen. That 
that way. Uh, vertically, 50 from the top, it's 25, 200 down, so it's 150 would be the middle. So this should spawn that, that sprite somewhere in the middle of the screen. And it didn't. Why didn't it spawn in the middle of the screen? Oh, because... Wait a minute, that should be... Oh no, this is half value, isn't it? So, half away across the screen is 160. So, half of that is 80. Plus the border is 12, so it should be 92. Sorry. Half the border and not the actual um, position. There we go. That's, that's, I mean, it's enough. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to randomize the starting position of this. So, we could just use the random value in here and it would be good enough. Um, I'll show you that now. I mean, it's it's easy enough to do. Um, so let's get to our enemy behaviors in here. So it's these values we need here. So uh, set static. So let me just check how the static works. I just need to remember. I think we can just set null as the second value. Yep. Uh, so we're going to change this to null and this to null. And then we're going to jump to the subroutine called random. This is going to give us a value between 0 and 255. So we need to convert this value into 0, uh, sorry, into minus 1 or 1. So the way we can do this is quite simple. Um, if we take the value that we get and we end it with 1, now we've got 0 or 1. So then if we shift that to the left, by one now we've got zero or two if we've got zero or two what we can do is then clear the carry bit add ff and now we've got ff or we've got one and now we can store that so th this routine here this this block of code let me let me explain that again so this will return a value from 0 to 255. This will just take the first bit of it, so we get 0 or 1, with equal weighting of both. So we've got an equal chance of having 0 and an equal chance of having 1. We shift the bytes to the left, which, which basically doubles the value, so we now have 0 or 2. And then we add 255 to it, so we either have 255 or 257. 257 will be wrapped around, so it becomes 1. Because uh, 256 is 0, 257 is 1. So now we have FF or 1. So we have minus 1 or 1. And we can start there. So now when we start this, um, I mean, actually, the, the, the direction it starts in is going to be the same uh, every time we restart because this is not random enough at the moment. Um, but if we were to change the seed value in here uh, to something different. <clears throat> We should hopefully see a different direction and we're not seeing a different direction. Why are we not seeing a different direction? <laughs> uh, typical, okay. Uh, oh, because we're not actually setting these values in here, okay. Uh, which we already had in place so we load the value in y uh, in the, the the static memory of the, uh, delta y store it in the y register and then load the static memory for x so now if we start this it's going that way please tell me this is going to be different if this is not different this is going to be an annoying thing to to debug oh no Try a few different seeds. Hopefully, this will change. And it's not changing. Okay. Um, why is that not changing? I'm going to put a break in here. I just want to see what's in the accumulator and the, the wire register. Oops. At that point. <coughs> So our accumulator is indeed minus one, our Y register is minus one. Okay, so let me 
change that value. I keep I see minus one, minus one. Everything's minus one, minus one. It feels like something's not working here. Let me think about this right. So we well, <clears throat> let's just remove this block of code. So we either got zero or one. So either it's not going to move, or it's going to move to the right or down. Let's just make sure everything's working properly. Uh, our accumulator is zero. Our Y is zero. Okay. Let's change that seed. Do something completely different. Our accumulator is zero, a Y is one. So we are getting some differences between those values. Um, it doesn't seem to be changing as often as I would like it to change though. It seems to be zero or one all the time. It doesn't seem to be changing from those values. Set static memory, null, dx null. UI null. Okay, let me just go and check the static memory setting. If value is null, oh wait a minute, there's the problem. That should be if the value is null, then load the key. No, no, if it's not null, yeah, no, that's right, sorry. Uh, okay. Ba, 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 ba. Where's my inhale? Let me just grab my uh What have I done with it? Thing is, when I've had enough alcohol, I actually need to, to smoke a lot more often. Um, okay. Why is that not? Okay, so. Is that a thalamus t shirt? It is indeed. There we go. Pretty much all the t-shirts I own are some variation of Commodore or or Amiga stuff. So maybe I'll have to start showing them as well as part of my uh, as part of my stream introduction as well as my wine. So this is from the um, from the Hunter's Moon uh, Kickstarter. They did a t-shirt uh, thing as well. So I've got a Hunter's Moon t-shirt and I've got a Thalamus t-shirt as well. On to the last glass of wine, and then we're on to bottle number two. Um, okay, so for some reason, this random doesn't seem to be giving us the values we want. Uh, it may be time to actually add the extra bit in. Let's let's just try some different values in here, because we're definitely getting some variation but every time I call this it's the same values every time it's like the seed is not being uh, being re re reset or something so accumulator of 0 y of 1 accumulator of 0 y1 and so on and it's the same all the time every time we run it that's not good. That's not what we want. Where is our break? Our break is in here. Okay. Well, uh, okay. This isn't setting every time, so this is this is obviously not going to change. Um, I'm just trying to wonder. I'm wondering why this isn't actually working correctly. This should be giving us zero. Uh, sorry, one or minus one, and it's not. It's giving us giving us minus one every time. 
shift to the left, that's correct. Because shift to the left will turn 1 into 2, or turn 0 into 0. I took out the negative code. Okay, so we've got... Oh, we have got different values. Okay, we've got an accumulator of FF. We've got a Y of 1. So, yes, now that sprite is moving in a different direction. Okay, so that does work. It's just... I think I was just getting really unlucky with the seed values. Okay, so let's let's enhance this, uh, this random function. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have... Um, an init function in here as well and we're going to call that from in here somewhere it doesn't really matter where it just needs to be part of the initialize so uh, let's do it here before the tables are generated and uh, I can't remember the value so I need to bring up the memory map I think it's DC04 um, Yeah, DC04, and we'll also need to do DD04. So the the CIA um, stuff are at DC00 for CI1 uh, and DD00 for CIA2. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set the values in um, both CIA1 and 2 to be slightly different. Um, doesn't matter what values they are as long as they are different. Um, and they, these are the time of start values. So these are the values that they're going to tick down from to zero. Um, so we'll set the the upper byte can be the same. It doesn't really matter. As long as the lower byte is different, then there'll be a mismatch between them. So they'll, they'll finish at different times, which is what you want. So we'll set the upper byte. We'll set that to FF. We want that to be the full thing. And we'll store that at DC04 and dd04 so this is sorry dd05 so this is our upper byte the lower byte however will set to something different so this really doesn't matter what we set it to um we'll set it to 7f on one and we'll set it to something even more random on the other one whoops why is that not working there we go uh, 3, 7 on the other one and we'll store that at DD04. Okay so now we've got two timers with slightly different offsets. Uh, we just disabled the interrupts for the CIAs, we didn't disable the CIA completely, just the interrupts and also that's not in the init, that's in the seed. It should, it should be there, there we go. So then the other thing we need to do is we need to set how this actually works. Um, and if I remember rightly, it's this one. So it's DC0E. So this one tells us how the timer works. So what we need to do is we need to start the timer. So this one. We need the timer to, uh, where is it? Be 50 hertz. Actually, it doesn't really matter which one you set, 60 or 50. This is just the, the speed that the timer works. Uh, and we need the timer to restart when it uh, when it's finished as well. So we need to make sure this one is zero. Oh, hi, Mr. Color. Mr. Color Raid. Hi, guys. Welcome to everyone that's joined along with Mr. Color. And uh, welcome to the stream, guys. Uh, we're just in the, the middle of creating a... <sighs> Pseudo-random is kind of giving it <laughs> giving it probably more benefit than it should have, to be honest. Uh, we're, we're creating a random, uh, a random function um, for our game. Which we we're, we're slowly turning into something which is almost playable. So, but yeah, welcome, welcome, guys. What have you guys been playing tonight over there? Always intrigued with Mr. Color Stream because your your, um, your range of kind of games is is very very wide, and I, I like to see what you play. You play a lot of interesting stuff. Um. <laughs>
So we're going to need to do this. We're going to need to load the start value into the timer. Uh, we need this to be zero. Uh, we need the speed to be set. We'll set this speed. Um, we don't need any of these. We don't need any of these. Uh, so we want to set a value of bit seven, bit one, and bit zero. So that would be 91. using timer A so we don't need to do timer B we do need it to start yep yeah, okay so that's good uh, then we can return from there and then all we need to do in here is when we do this EOR we also EOR with this lower value as well Checking out stuff on the Mr. FPGA system. Looked at the 486 PC core. It runs pretty well. Doom is playable. Oh, okay. You have to tweak it a little bit. I read some Amiga AGA stuff on the Minimate core and ran it off with a little C64. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So, the 486 PC core, will that run on the Turbo Chameleon? Because I know Gunstar Heroes has been doing some stuff with the Turbo Chameleon. Uh, today, getting the uh, the mini mid core working on it, um, it'd be really cool if I could play Doom on my Turbo Chameleon through while it's plugged into the C64. That would feel amazing. I mean, I know it wouldn't be the C64 doing any of the work, um, but it would be it would be kind of cool. And I do like Doom. Doom is one of my my early kind of mapping loves. So I used to do a lot of. Um, FPS mapping back in the day, so I did a lot of Doom, uh, Quake 2, Quake 3, Unreal Tournament, uh, Half-Life, things like that, and um, uh, and Doom is the the kind of one that kicked it all off for me. Um, when I when I realised that I could take this little application on my PC and make make a Doom level, I was absolutely ecstatic. It was the best thing ever. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to have a go at that again. That would be insanely cool. I'm going to have to look that up at some point. Because I think if I could play Doom through my C64. I mean, I know it would be through the Turbo Chameleon. But it would still be using the joystick and the keyboard from the C64. Uh, on my zip stick. That would just feel freaking amazing. I would love that. Do you know what? I don't think I've... I, th there's only one map I've still got. Um which I think you can download online somewhere, which is for um, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, back when it was just the the Quake 3 kind of... Well, it was, it was a separate game, but it was based on the Quake 3 engine. Um, I made a map called uh, Divine Retribution, which was a, a kind of church and a castle, and you had the allies in the church and the, uh, the axis in the castle, and you had to kind of go and steal the documents from the castle. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy. It. In fact, Return to Castle Wolfenstein was probably the one I I did the most work on. I I did the most maps on that more than anything, I think. And and probably Unreal Tournament was a very close second. Um, I did a lot of uh, Quake Three maps um, in Unreal Tournament, so I took Q3 DM16, uh, Q3 DM1 as well, and did them in uh, Unreal Tournament 2000 and. Or whatever it was, I can't remember what it was. It was one of the one of the first kind of modern versions of Unreal Tournament. I redid those in in uh, Unreal, and it was really cool. I like that. <clears throat> can't wait for the next Doom postponed thing. Yeah, I've got to admit, I am looking forward to that as well. Um, it's another one of the reasons I'm rebuilding this beast of a machine. So um, between Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Uh, Doom Eternal. Um, what's the other one as well? There's another one. Oh my god, I've gone blank. I've gone completely blank. I can't remember what it is. There's a, there's, there's a couple of games that I'm building this machine specifically for. Um, 
I want to be able to play at 8K. That's my that's my dream, um, and I think this machine will just about do it. I think um, I just need to get the monitor to deal with it. So <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there aren't there aren't very many options for 8K monitors at the moment. So uh, I think in fact there's only one that's really good enough, uh, which is the Dell uh, some some Dell monitor. Um, but I, I want to be able to play uh, either 8K uh, on a monitor or I want to be able to play 4K maxed out HDR on, on a 50 inch, uh, 144 inch TV. So 144 hertz TV, sorry, not 144 inch. That would be insane. Yeah, 8K. That's what I'm aiming for. That's what my new machine's going to be for. So dual 2080 Ti's. So. Looking forward to it. It's gonna be a beast. Um, okay, so this routine now should it should look pretty much the same as before, um, except now that we're actually let's put a capital. Oh, in fact, let's not put a capital in there. Let's go and fix it. Uh, but now we're using the CIA CIA timers. These should be a little bit more random than before. Uh, so we've got minus one on accumulator, uh, plus one on Y register. I don't think this is going to change because the timings are still going to be exactly the same every time and it still does rely on timers. So um, it's not going to change at the moment, but that's fine. Let's get rid of the break. But now we know that when at any time this spawns, it's going to pick a random direction. So yeah, I do like the higher refresh rates as well. So I'm using a, a Predator X34 for my uh, PC gaming, which does 120 hertz, I think. Um, and I've got to say, I absolutely love it. I, I considered getting the uh, the Omen X65 uh, 50-inch TV monitor. So sorry, 65-inch TV monitor, because uh, that does 144 hertz at uh, 4K as well. Um, but to be honest, it's three and a half grand and I don't want to spend three and a half thousand pounds on, on what is essentially a TV without a tuner in it. So um, I've been looking at the 8K stuff. Um, there isn't anything that's got adaptive refresh rate in 8K. Um, the, the Dell one does 60 hertz at 8K um, and doesn't have any adaptive refresh rate for other resolutions. So I'm a bit a bit cautious about getting that. One other option as well is to get very thin bezeled um, 4K monitors and use four of them. Uh, with dual cards, you can quite easily set that up to be an 8K matrix and it won't look too bad, but you really want a thin bezel on it because you don't want the very middle to have this black cross in it where your, where your monitors cross. Um, I've seen some people that will actually mod the... Uh, oh, no, that's only 4K Acme Fin. That's, that's a 4K... 65 inch um, G-Sync uh, TV stroke monitor. It's a monitor, but it's uh, it's it's almost a TV in terms of its size. Uh, I have seen people that mod uh, 4K monitors to basically take the bezels off um, and and join them together to create kind of 8K grids. Uh, but to be honest, it's it's probably a little bit bit beyond my kind of skills. Really, I'm I'm a bit wary about um, re like creating a new uh, a new kind of plastic enclosure for them. I don't have that skill set. My my 3D printer is big, but it's not going to be able to do um, you know it's not going to be able to do those kind of uh, those sets. So yeah. Yeah, 4K is amazing. Uh, to be honest, I, I rarely game in 4K. I, I game if I can if I can sit on the couch and play it, then I will game in 4K. Or if it's a first person shooter, I'm on I'm on the 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 Predator, and that's only uh, three four forty by fourteen forty. So it's ultra wide. Um, I mean, it still looks amazing. It's great, um, but it's it's not 4K. Uh, okay, so we've got this all working now. Now we need to make it detect uh, if it hits the edges and change directions. So let's have a look. Yeah, I have interest, guys. If you if you are playing um, 
PC games, uh, let me know what you're playing at the moment. Like my, fairly modern, like within the past two or three years, PC games, because um, I'm I'm starting to play more and more at the moment, and uh, it'd be really nice to kind of hook up with you guys and and do some multiplayer now and again. Uh, for me, the big game is Battlefield Five. Um, I haven't played it for a few months, but I was uh, when it first came out, I was absolutely ha hooked on it. So, um, but I'm I'm happy to play pretty much anything. Um, you know, I've, I've got I've probably got most of the games anyway. So, if you guys want to do a a multiplayer hookup sometime, then then let me know. Okay. Let's uh, let's add some extra collision in. So we need to check. Um, we need to check up, down, left, and right. So let's start by working out where we need to check. So basically, if we're moving, if we're moving up, then we need to check up. If we're moving down, we need to check down, and and so on, left and right. Uh, so we're only ever going to have to check two of those because we're always going to move on diagonal. So we need to either check left and up left and down or right and up right and down um so we need to work out which one of those we need to do so let's have a look so the game i've been playing at the moment actually is uh borderlands 3 i've been playing a lot of that and i know i know people have a go at epic games and i know that it's kind of fashionable to hate on them and I agree, you know, their, their their strategy is kind of very aggressive, but they kind of have to be aggressive because Steam has such a monopoly on the market that if they're not aggressive, they're not going to get the customers. Um, so it is kind of a bit shitty the way they're going about it, but they're, they're trying to make amends. They're trying to give free games here and there. So, And Borderlands 3 is a very good game. I've got to say, it's it's a very, very nice game. Okay, so based on these values, we need to work out what we're going to do. So let's start by just doing the vertical collision. So let's uh, let's get that that value from memory here. So this is either going to be minus one or it's going to be one. So what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll add one to it. Oops. Damn it. Uh, and then we'll shift it to the right. So now it's zero or one. Another company with Chinese overlords, yeah. And I, I I've got to say that the, so, um, and, and Colt will appreciate this if he's still around. The, um, the the stuff that goes on when you start up Epic Games Launcher is insane. If you compare it to other games, uh, to other game launchers, Epic Mega Games is horrific. I mean, they scan so many things on your computer when you start up. It's absolutely horrendous what they do. Um, oh, thank you for the follow. Whoever that was, I saw a follow. Uh, hang on. F Mega. Thank you for the follow, F Mega. Welcome to the stream. Um, yeah, they scan so much on your computer. In terms of kind of intrusive behavior, the Epic, uh, the games. Um, launcher is worse than most of the I'm glad you call them epic mega games still <laughs> is that what I keep calling them I can't help it <laughs> but to be honest I, I think what they're doing is they're, they're trying to compete with Steam and Steam when it comes to the PC kind of digital market they are massive and, and epic can only compete with them if they use these kind of aggressive tactics and one of the things they do and this is what this is what's got people worried um about the chinese kind of influence is they do scan a lot of what goes on on your computer uh one of the things they do is they scan your steam friends list and your steam library and your steam purchases on startup and I think the reason they're doing it is because they just want to get those metrics. They want to know what games you're interested in. They want to know what you've bought, what you're looking to buy, what your friends have bought, what your friends are playing. And so that they can target their advertising and their sales specifically at the popular games. I think that's all they're doing. Um, but obviously it sparks lots of kind of worry and, and stuff. So... Yeah, I I don't mind. I mean, to be honest, with the the 
the whole kind of Chinese thing, they can take what they want from me. I mean, what are they going to get? They're going to get a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of Commodore games. I mean, I'd be, I'd be ecstatic if they released my Commodore games under the Epic label or, you know, there's, there's very little they can steal from me that I care about. Um, I do most of my stuff on my phone anyway. Um, I do very little kind of money related things on my computer, if anything at all. My emails, okay, they could get my passwords from some things, but again, I, I'm not important enough. I, I'm pretty sure they're not that bothered about it. Um, they're just being they're just being highly aggressive in a mar in a very a very kind of monopolized market. I think. Okay, this bloody thing is not working. Okay, so to go back to what we're doing, um, we're going to grab the. Uh, the direction the y direction we're going to turn it from minus one and uh, to one into zero and one and then we're going to use this to look up a value in a in a table which we might as well stick up here actually so let's call this table um uh, collision points y so this is going to be zero if it is minus one and it's going to be one if it's positive. So if it's minus one, we need to. God, I'm forgetting how to do freaking labels now. I can tell I've been drinking. Uh, so if it's minus one, we need something at the top of the sprite. If it's positive one, we need something at the bottom. So let's just, for now, let's just stick these values in like so. Um, Actually, that would be 20, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be 21? Like so, so it's going to be right in the edges of the things. Yeah, I, I mean, do you know what? I, I, I should know better. As, as somebody who's kind of trying desperately to get into the security scene, I, I, I should know better, and it probably will bite me on the ass, but... At the moment, I'm... I'm kind of happy to hand over that kind of information. I'm I'm fairly vigilant with most stuff, so um, I mean to to give some examples. If I download something on my phone and ask for permissions, I won't just click accept. I will scrutinize every single thing um, to the point where if a if an app won't let me install it without me giving it certain permissions that I don't agree with, I just won't bother with it. I'll I'll uninstall it and I won't bother continuing trying to uh, activate that application same with the cookie things as well you know if you go to a site and it starts saying oh we need to share this information blah blah. no nope, sorry if i don't want to give you that information i won't do it so i i'm fairly vigilant i think i'm probably um better than the average kind of non kind of technical user out there but um there are certain things that i will gladly sacrifice for and gaming unfortunately is one of them and i, I wasn't going to miss out on some games just because i didn't want to install the epic games launcher um i'm, I'm perfectly happy to use epic games uh, i'm i don't agree with the fact that they're they're doing some of the stuff that they're doing but i i don't care enough about the stuff that they could potentially collect for it to be a problem so Um, okay, so now we've got these new collision points, so we're going to grab those collisions, so there is a, there we go, get enemy collisions. Okay, so here's another interesting thing, um, get enemy collisions doesn't seem to have that thing in as well, so again we need this accumulator Y register thing in here, so let's go and have a look at that behaviour. Uh, there we go. Okay, so okay, so this is actually loading these values into the accumulator. Also, so this is going to be quite a simple one. So, if off, x offset isn't null, then we'll do this. If x offset is null, then we'll just go straight away and, and use the values that we send in. So. Nice and easy change, nothing nothing too complicated. Um, so we need to transfer that to the Y register and there we get 
There we go. Uh, and so we need to do the same with the dx value. So we get the dx. We add one to it. We shift it to the right, which is going to half that value. So now we go from uh, zero and two to zero and one. Uh, we don't transfer it to the Y register, and now we've got the value that's either, you know, we we know we we can work out where that value is based on on these these settings here. Um, so from that point, we can do these. Oops. Oh, damn it. There we go. Flashlight app. This app has that. The thing is, though, the flashlight app, I, I mean, I don't know what, what OS you're using there, but for me, the flashlight is part of the OS, so I use Android, and I just, you know, I can swipe down on my on my thing here, and I have a flashlight, and that's it. I can turn my flashlight on um, as part of the OS, so I'm imagining that's an iOS thing as well. Yeah, vote with your wallet. The, the, the annoying thing is, though, is I think people value money more than they value they value data so your average consumer your average kind of granny in you know wherever you know 50 year old woman with an iphone values the cash in her bank account more than she values the data so i think what's happening is um companies have realized that and companies are now um now tr now treat data in the same way they used to treat money T data is valuable for them so 50 is not old yeah i know it's not old i'm i'm 42 i'm i'm quite close to 50 anyway so <laughs> i'm just saying like your average kind of you know middle aged middle aged woman is not going to think about the the value of data versus the value of money they're just going to see um yeah, ill-informed exactly. They're they're going to see money as something more valuable to them. But what they don't realise is actually that the the data that they provide to these companies is worth more to those companies than the money is because they can make more money than you would give them in a subscription just by having that data. That's the the, the whole principle of Facebook is built around this. I mean, uh, Facebook don't charge any money to their users because they don't need to. The the money they make from the data that they they procure. Is, is just way more than they could ever, ever, um, you know, charge charge users for a subscription. For two reasons. One, if they charge users a subscription, um, they wouldn't have as many users. Um, and, and so that's not a, a model they want to go down. They would rather have more users um, all giving data than a small amount of users paying um, and, and, and not giving data. Um, they would make way more money from that. So, uh, and and the other reason is is that that data is more valuable. Data is 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 constantly given. If I give you eight pounds, right? That's eight pounds once. If I give you my data, you can keep finding ways to reuse that data and make money off it constantly. And okay, while it might not make you eight pounds instantly, like me giving you eight pounds, over the course of ten years you probably make more than £8 out of it, so... I miss the most in my creeperitos. <laughs> yeah, uh, to be honest, that's what mine are as well, mostly things like that. Uh, okay, right, let's get back to the code. I'm, I'm going on a bit of a rant about, about data protection. <laughs> I probably shouldn't. Let me top up my wine. Guys, I'm going to have a quick break. Because uh, we're at the end of that wine. I have got another one. Oop, nearly dropped it. So this one is... Um, I've had this one before, actually. It's a Sauvignon Blanc um, Bicicleta. I'm not sure where it's from, actually. It's from... Let's have a look. It doesn't say. Oh, it's chilli as well. It's another chilli wine. <laughs> And this is the funny thing, right, Andy? They don't need that data to be accurate. 
because they have the trust of their their, their, their clients, the the advertisers, the kind of the, the data analysts that they have as clients trust their data. So even if it is inaccurate, it doesn't matter. Even if it's inaccurate, data, it doesn't matter because they they can still sell it on and they can still make money from it. So. Am I a wine savvy? Um, no, I mean I tend to drink wine on on stream anyway. Um, I wouldn't say I'm wine savvy or anything. I, I do definitely have my preferences, um, but it's kind of become a thing. I mean we're what 14, 15 episodes into this now, 14. Um, so I, I I tend to kind of share what wine I'm drinking on each one. Uh, thanks, Amok. Thanks for joining the stream. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah, I, I I need to focus more on the code. We're kind of we're kind of slipping a bit. We've we've done one thing really, and not not much more. So uh, I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, we're gonna we're gonna finish this uh, behavior properly, um, and then if we've got time, we will add in sprite to projectile detection, so we can actually start hitting the enemies with our projectiles. That will that will put us in a good place, I think. Um, all right, uh, let's. Uh, Let's take five, guys. I'll be right back. Be right back. And I'm back. Yeah, I do need a mind refresh. <laughs> Let's get back to what we're doing. Okay, so we've done very little code actually tonight. It's been it's been lots of little other things. Uh. Okay, so I was trying to get the character moving in different directions, which I'd done. Hang on, it was in this one. There we go. So we'd set the random position up, and we'd get the memory here, and we'd get the collision. So now we know, at this point here, we should know what character is being uh, detected. So if, I'm just going to double check that by putting, um, by drawing something in the in the path. So this is the actual character that we're getting. Mm, it's not. All right, well, we'll just we'll do some detection. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll debug it. So we'll just do a colorable for now. So it's only gonna it's only gonna deflect off the um, off the white platforms at the moment. So it's only gonna deflect off these. We'll make it deflect off everything that's solid because at the moment, if we jump here, a character actually can move vertically through these these platforms um, but it can't move sideways through them you can see there's a little bit of a, a stop as it moves side to side um, so we're gonna make this this thing bounce off the the Y off the um, bounce bounce in the Y direction off these white platforms uh, and then we'll see if there's any problem with that routine so at this point here we should have uh, a non-zero value um, so if it's zero uh, no y bounce so let's create a, uh, a label here called no y bounce uh, however if there is a y bounce what we need to do is we need to negate the value that's in dy okay so we need to get that value and this value is either going to be FF or it's going to be 1. So we can very simply just do that. And that should be enough to negate that value. And we pass null in because we've already got it in the accumulator. So let's have a look at what that's doing now. So hopefully every time it hits something in the Y direction, it should bounce off. And it is, but it seems to be going at the wrong speed um, we need to deflect off the edges of the screen as well unfortunately uh, it seems to be going faster in one direction than the other so let's think about that if we've got FF then the value that he yours is going to be 0 if we've got 0 1 then the value is going to be FE so actually we need to add 1 to it as well oops So just to explain why that happens, right? So the value can either be FF 
or zero one. If it's FF and we and we EOR with FF, what we'll get is zero zero. If it's zero one and we uh, we OR it with the FF, we'll get FE. So now what we're getting is um, either minus two or zero, and that's not good. So we need to we need to add one to this so we get zero one or FF. And that's why we do this this clear and add one. So let's do that again and we should see a fairly smooth transaction between the two. Okay, there's a bit of a weird bounce as it goes between these two, but I think that's just because the, the collision uh, the collision points are too high and too low at the moment. Um, we'll change those in a minute. Let's just make sure that this is actually working correctly. Uh, unfortunately, it's in a weird place, so it's going to be difficult. Oh, come on. It doesn't actually seem to be mounting, so... Darth Vader's the speed up. X is half values. Um, it is indeed. We will... We will adjust that in a minute. Actually, X is only half values when we set it. Um, internally, it, it, it's, it should be the full values because it's a full 24-bit value. So, I think we need to we need to set the ed screen edge boundaries as well because um, we're seeing problems um, where it's doing this weird loop in the the MSB because it's you know the the 255 values that it, it can loop around this area for first so let, let's do the whole thing and then we can we can work it out later so let's um so we we get that we invert it that's fine let's do the same with the the x value so we get the collision um, see, I'm a bit worried about this. I'm worried that this isn't getting the right value. So let, let's let's debug this a little bit. Let's well, let's let's work it out. So if the y is you are too good at this, not many epic fails for the lols. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you know what? The the wine is hitting me really hard as well. I think I think the lack of kind of alcohol over the past two weeks is kind of really <laughs> really hitting me a lot now um so where is this actually checking because is we need so given let's let's draw a little kind of ascii thing in here okay so this is our character here right so I think what this is doing a static memory okay so we get the y position we uh, the y direction sorry and we turn it into zero or one and that sets these points here so actually this is setting these corners so we're actually checking um, we're checking this point here this point here like so which we're, we're checking those four points and I think actually what we need to be checking is two different points um, we need to when we're doing the Y we just need to check that point like so and when we're doing the X we need to check um, these points so this needs to actually be two different checks And so what we need to do is in the case of the Y position, which is what we're checking here, uh, let's put so we, we can kind of block this off so we know that this whole section here is the Y bounce. Um, we actually need this null to not be null. We need this to be not 
based on this, but only based on the Y. So actually, when we're checking the when we're checking the Y position, we actually want this to be in the middle. So we want this to be like 11 or something. So we check that there. Then now we're only checking this point and this point because before what we were checking was the corners. We don't want to check the corners. We want to check straight down and straight up. So we don't need to read the X value at all. So let's try that. That might be a little bit better. <sighs> I wish it was in a slightly different place now, to be honest. Because it's just going to flick around over that side of the screen. Um, okay, let's just wait. Maybe it's going to land in a place where it's... Actually, so this might come here now. No. Oh, it is bouncing. It is bouncing off stuff. It's just doing it. Okay, let's let's do the rest. Let's get let's get the X bouncing. So. So let's label this X bounce. Let's call this no X bounce. And this time we're going to get the X position. Uh, we're not going to transfer that to the the Y register because that is this this property here, and instead we're going to set the Y register to halfway across. So the the sprite is twenty four across. Um, so should we see? Actually, this first one here should probably be A. That's probably more accurate because uh, it's twenty one high. So half of that is ten and a half. Let's make it ten. Uh, this is 21. Yeah, okay. That should be more accurate now. Uh, so we check. Uh, we get the static memory X. And we store it back again. Okay, so this should hopefully be a little bit better. Uh, the only thing we'll need to do is check the screen edges as well because the screen edges as you can see it goes off the top of the screen there's no boundaries so now we end up with this weird thing where we're stuck on the MSB on this side alright let's put the screen edges in because that's that's getting a bit weird isn't it okay so Y bounce wise, we need to definitely Y bounce um, if we've hit the edges of the screen. So um, before we even check, hang on, do we need to check it there? Let's think, right, so we add a value, we get the direction, we check the collision, get enemy collisions. Should we do it in the enemy collisions? Maybe, maybe the enemy collisions should check the edge of the screen as a as a bounce boundary yeah I think that's probably the way okay let, let's try it and see what happens so get enemy collisions okay so we get our enemy positions get enemy collision point okay so that's gonna get this is gonna return the value the value no sorry this is gonna return the character at that point no this is gonna return the screen position at that point this is gonna get the character at that point so what we need to do here is actually if the if the screen position is minus one or positive one in the Y offset, then we're going to return a character that is definitely fully collidable. So this might not be the right place to do it. Uh, let's go back to here again. Let's have a look. Let's think. Okay, so we get the Y position. No, we're getting the Y. No, maybe it is in there. Maybe this is the right place to do it.
Okay, let's try it in here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to check if the screen point is outside our our screen boundary. So our screen is, um, let me remember now, it's 22 high, 40 wide. So if it's outside of that area, then we're going to automatically assume that it's a solid wall so that we bounce off it. So we're going to get, let's let's do the Y offset first. So this is the only one we care about at the moment. We're just doing the Y. So let's load the Y offset. Um, if it's plus, we go to here. So this is, this is our, we'll call it skip. God, I can still have had a drink, it's getting more and more difficult. So if we go to skip, then nothing's happened. Otherwise we will um we will do this. Uh, and we'll put end here as well. So we can jump to this. So what we'll do is something like this. We will get the character at that location. So we will load the accumulator with let's pick a character. Doesn't really matter, we're just gonna trick it into thinking there's a, a character here. Um No, nope, that's not it. That's a completely different project. I should probably close that because you shouldn't really see what I'm working on. That was kind of bad of me. I shouldn't have shown that. No, that's the old one. We need the new one. There we go. So we'll just pick a random character that has the the, the colorable because this is this is both colorable and solid as well as you can see with the materials here. So um, we will return this character as well. It looks like whatever it was, you filled it all up. Yes, it's. Um... I mean, I can give you a little bit of information. I am working on a remaster of uh, an existing C64 game, and that was the character set from that game. Um, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> that's probably too much anyway. Uh, so let's return 03 from that. So that would imply that that character is 03. Uh, Oh, there we go. Holy crud. <laughs> yeah. So now we're just checking if the value is negative, i.e. we're off the top of the screen. Uh, then we will set the value to 0, 03. So we'll pretend that there is a solid character there and we will exit. Um, so we also need to do a comparison if the value is less than 22 then we can also jump to skip oh my god I can't type at all this wine is really hitting me strong tonight really really strong Is that not working? Value command algorithm is null. I'm 161 enemy macros. 161. What? what? Why offset? Why offset? Um. Okay. I'm not sure why that's failing. That should be fine. If anybody can figure out why that's failing, then um. Bonus points to you. Um, I'm not doing anything unusual. I mean, I'm using the same command up there. The value of a command argument must be an integer. Oh, hang on. 
it could be null. Okay, this could be null. So these values could be null. Okay. So, uh, let me think about this. And in fact, in our case, it's definitely going to be null because we're passing in null here. Uh, so, hmm. Okay, need to think about this. Uh, let me think. So we're passing in in Y offset but we're passing it in as null so this is actually already in the Y register which means we'd need to store the accumulator and the Y register um, okay think about this Okay. Yeah, that should be fine, I think. is only going to work if it's oh see it's doing weird stuff i'm not i'm not pleased with how that's working at all seems to be bouncing off weird stuff i don't know why okay so let's add let's add the other side of this in um with the x register um which is basically just copying this thing here uh, and doing it with the accumulator because the accumulator is either going to be X offset or it's going to be set from um, it's going to be passed in by null here as well so actually no that's not right is it because because enemy get collision point does not return A and Y it returns A and X if I remember rightly Oh no, it does return A and Y. Okay. Oh no, that is right. Okay, fair enough. And this is going to be 40. He will fly around and he will bounce off of um, solid objects. So he will he will just kind of imagine a breakout ball kind of being fired into this into this background. He'll he'll bounce around. Isn't why used in the subroutine? Tout, I guess that's subroutine. Uh, let's have a look. Is it you? Oh, you mean get enemy collisions? Okay, let's. Uh, this should be all right because at this point here, oh, maybe I'm. Maybe I'm. Drank a little bit too much wine to think about this, but I am going to figure it out. Which my freaking smoke thing would work. There we go. Need to fill this up actually. It's the first stuff that is. No, not that one. That one.
This is the return value in enemy macros. The accumulator is the return value in here. Um, get character out. Let me just check the get character out function. I just want to make sure that is actually set. Uh, utils. Utils. There we go. We only have one function in here, uh, which is the accumulator. Okay. Um, okay. So the accumulator is the correct value to be returned. Okay, so we get our direction. We use the direction. We use the direction to figure out which character we should be looking at. I think maybe what I need to do is debug what character is actually being checked here as well. Uh, so in this get enemy collisions function uh, macro, wherever it is. Get enemy collision. See the, this function here, I think, is probably needs a little bit of stuff adding to it. So this gets our get collision point gets gives returns as a, a screen position, um, and that screen position. Let me just get rid of the other enemy because I don't want to have two enemies wandering around the screen while I'm doing this because it will make things a bit more complicated than it needs to be. I'm just going to comment out this one for a second. Um, see at this point now we have um, we have an X and a Y I think. Get collision point returns uh, an X and a Y. No, it returns an accumulator and a Y. Okay. So accumulator is our X position. Uh, so I'm just going to do some temporary code here. So I'm going to push that accumulator onto the stack. I'm going to load the accumulator with uh, tables.screen. What's it called now? Screen row or something. Screen row LSB. Here we go. Let's just put it in some random place for now. I don't really care. Um, and we can pull that and transfer it to the wire register. And then load the accumulator with... Oh, it's a raid. Thank you for the raid, not null, not void. And uh, welcome to everybody that's come along with null, not void. It's a new name. I've not seen you guys before. I hope you've been having a good night. What have you guys been doing on stream tonight? You joined us in the middle of trying to figure out some random Commodore 64 um, bug after two bottles of wine, or well, one and a half bottles of wine, should I say so. And thank you for the follow as well. Hi Aston, welcome to the stream. Yeah, this is... I think I've had too much wine to figure this out, but I am, I am going to persevere and I'm going to try. Wish my bloody thing would <laughs> work better. Aiming for that Bulma Peak on uh, um I kind of do this every stream, so I... I tend to drink heavily on stream, however it's been uh, two weeks since I've been able to drink anyway. Um, so I've, I, I think tonight I've kind of gone over the Balmer peak and I think I'm at a point where <laughs> it's becoming quite difficult to figure stuff out. So, But I'm, I'm not going to give up, I'm going to keep trying. I'm not going to give up at all. Yeah, I think I'm past it tonight. I think I've I think I've got over it. Uh, okay, let's just stick a random value in there. So we know O3 had that weird. Oh no, let's not put O3 because that's that's got the collision in it. Let's pick a 38. That'll do.
Oh yeah, I'll keep at it, Edison, definitely. I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm not a quitter. No way am I a quitter. Okay, so this whole block is a little bit of a debug block. Hopefully this should kind of map what's going on when we get the enemy collisions. We should see where it's checking. Uh, so we can see it's picking a weird row up here. Um, which probably explains why it's doing something weird. So, so this weird character that it's drawing here is supposed to be... It's supposed to be where it's checking and it's not at all. Um, okay, so we're getting there. Okay, so we are doing something wrong here, which is we're not doing the index here. So let's try that again. <clears throat> okay, that's a bit better. So that actually looks like it's checking the correct area, but you can see it's kind of flickering between, between left and right. It's not quite accurate enough. It's also checking this side when it should be over here. So let's just reload that. Actually, I can't reload, can I? I've got to rebuild. <clears throat> so it's fine. And then it should bounce off the bottom and it's not bouncing off the bottom. So you can see how these characters kind of definitely locked to this bottom of the screen, but then they didn't it didn't bounce off the bottom. <laughs> also note how the character is moving down, but that that did not seem to be in the right place. <coughs> okay, so let's leave this in here for now. Let's put debug in there so I know it's debug and I can know to delete it at a later date. Let's underscore it here as well. <coughs> but yeah, they're in the wrong place, aren't they? Definitely. So but let's start it again, but let's put the uh, maximum speed to like 50%. Let's have a look at what's going on at half speed. <clears throat> so yeah, this, this character sprite should be checking underneath us and it's not. We're only checking the Y position and this is actually seems to be checking somewhere random in the X position. So let's have a look. <clears throat> So cool, you had a second 6502 assembly stream I'm on today. The previous one was NES game coding. Let's see somebody. I'm assuming the previous one was probably Zorkenheimer. <coughs> um, he's the only other person I know that does 6502 on stream. Um, and he's he's my first choice of somebody to raid when um, when I end my stream. So, And I think likewise for him as well. So. But Zork's cool, yeah. Zork pops in, pops in quite often and uh, and joins in. I do like to watch Zork stream now and again when I get the chance. Thank you for the follow, Esden. And again, welcome to the stream. It's very much appreciated. Okay, let's let's have a let's have a check and see what's going on. So we know when we're debugging this now. Um, that this character is in the wrong place. So let's just slow it down a little bit more so we can just determine what's going on. Um, nice debug trick. Yeah, it's, it's uh, see, it's picking here. We should be checking below. At this point, we're only checking in the Y position. So we only care about the Y movement at the moment, which means the character that it should be checking is right below. Um, and it doesn't seem to be doing that. No characters are appearing below the character, below the uh, sprite. They're appearing to the left of the sprite. So, so this is the first issue that we've got. So let's go and have a look at that. So um, this is our behaviour. So we we get the enemy collision based on whether it's negative or positive. So FF or one, we. We add one, we shift it to the right, so that now becomes zero or one. So zero would be negative, which means up the screen, and one would be positive. And that is stored in the Y register, so that should be the Y, that's fine. Let's have a look. So zero and 20, so this should be right. That's really weird why that's not picking the right values. Um... 
Hmm, okay, interesting. Oh, I need more wine. Let's get the wine topped up. <clears throat> it's not as nice as the last wine, this one. I mean, it's okay, but it's it's not as nice. I do like that um, Castellero del Diablo, or whatever it's called. It's um much nicer to it's much easier to drink than this. Um okay, so get enemy collisions null null. I wonder if, if this is wrong somewhere. Let's let's go and check out this. Let's make sure this is correct. X offset, Y offset. Okay, so we should be getting the Y offset, and the Y offset is our Y position. So we should be getting the right row from here. Um, and we should be storing it at the right place. And it does definitely seem to be following the character. If these, if these values were the wrong way around, we'd see the kind of the 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 the, 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 the kind of the line of characters go off in a different direction, but they're following the character. They're following quite closely. They're just in the wrong place. Um, today was a Twitch live coding rabbit hole expedition, so I need to make a little stream for that. Yeah, as Ackman Finn says, we uh, on a Saturday we do this game. Um, so this is a game that we're we're going to do um, for the Commodore 64. It's going to be a 16 kilobyte limit, so the whole game is going to fit on a 16 kilobyte cartridge um, uh, with a name to potentially, if if our GCD hosts a 16 kilobyte competition this year, uh, usually in December, uh, we'll enter it into that. Um, we'll we'll get to like June next year, so we've got plenty of time. Uh, May or June or something like that. And then on a Thursday we do a dissect. So um, subs to the stream or subs to my Patreon, which I'll add a link to in the chat now, uh, can suggest C64 games that we will um, load up into the debugger uh, and investigate and see how they work and if there's anything we can do to to fix any issues that people have got with them. Um, or, or add features or improvements to them. Um, so to give you an idea of how the debugger works, let's uh, load this up in the debugger. Um, so this is a debugger that came out within the last year or so for the Commodore 64 and allows you to kind of really kind of drill into what's going on both in the, the code and the, the sprite system and stuff. Um, I wish I know what was going on with this character though. Uh, okay. Let's start again. Let's have a look. Also, subs to the Patreon will get a PDF um, of the PDF write up of the streams, which is a little bit behind at the moment. Um, well, quite a bit behind actually. I am working kind of hard to get get them out it's actually a lot more work than I thought it was going to be to do these uh, these PDFs I know it's how the X position bounce then have I got X position I have got X bouncing let's turn the X bounce off I don't want to get confused by that one the one good thing about keeping the PDF slightly behind the stream is that there's occasional streams where I go on kind of weird tangents um, and end up kind of wasting a lot of time doing stuff and the PDF allows me to kind of skip that. Um, okay, we're not seeing anything here. Have I, if I turn off the position sprite, I have. Damn it. Uh, the PDF allows me to kind of skip over that stuff and, and, and just get to kind of the core of what, what we needed to do, so... Yeah, documentation does take a lot. I, I mean, I've done. I, I'm quite big on documentation anyway in my my day to day job. So, I I know how much it takes, but I kind of I severely underestimated just how much it takes uh, to document a game like this on the Commodore 64. And I think it's mostly because um, I'm not writing this documentation for experienced 
6502 coders I'm writing it for beginners so a lot of it is kind of explaining in detail how uh, the stack works or, or uh, how to do 16-bit you know uh, shifting or addition or multiplication and things like that so it does take a lot more than I would have liked I think um, okay so just moving in the Y direction let's have a look what happens here let's speed it up again not seeing any bouncing off the surfaces which is what's bothering me it is checking the wrong position that's that's the annoying thing it's checking the wrong position of the sprite let's let's try and set hard-coded values for these this sprite so um, instead of setting these values with this let's actually just set the values directly so we're already setting the Y so let's check the uh, the, the the X position um, sorry the Y position to 20 and let's see what happens let's see if that actually moves it okay that does actually seem to be checking below the sprite now um, let me just restart that I think I think this is the problem I think the Y position is not being picked up correctly yeah that seemed to be checking below the sprite okay I'm gonna do it one more time this time I'm gonna actually slow it down too slow sometimes ah see that does seem to be checking below the sprite that character there below the sprite I mean it does seem to pick one over here which is a bit strange but at least we're getting there in terms of the direction but see that sprite there should have bounced it back but that could be because we're actually setting that value so let me turn off um, let me turn off that so it doesn't actually store that value oh my god click god damn it there we go so it doesn't actually redraw that value there let's let's see if that um it will now bounce so it should bounce off this corner here this should have been way easier than it is this is already taken me like an hour and a half or so should have been way less than this. Oh, typically it would go the other way now, wouldn't it? Okay. That's that's so frustrating. It's not supposed to be that random. And it didn't bounce off the bottom, okay. Um, okay, so let's keep this in here. Let's make sure that wherever that wherever that sprite is, whatever direction it's moving in, it checks the right locations. So, first of all, we're only checking it up and down. So, let's make sure that this routine is always going to check the correct location based on which way it's going. So, at the moment we're checking down. See, that's not down there's a double row there's like a double row of characters going down and I don't know why that is um, is there like a clear something in here that's not happening clear carry bit would that affect this in any way did not do should it let's check the utils Clear carry bit should not affect that either. Okay. For C64, every time it's Turrican 2 for me. Just because that's the game I played the most growing up. So, um, I'm sure it's not the most Commodore 64 game out there. I mean, it's, it's most people would probably, if I said Turrican, they'd probably think Amiga more than they would Commodore. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. It's a tricky one. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. But regardless of what I pass it, so I'm always passing in the same collision point here, but I'm getting a double character. So let me think about this. If this is... This is drawing the character, and this is taking the Y register, which is get collision point. Let's have a look at get collision point. Is oh, damn it! I'm so annoyed. It should be should be way further than this at the moment. Okay, so we do a comparison here, so that means the carry bit is not important because we're already doing that check at this point. Um, we're, we're setting the carry bit and clearing the carry bit where we needed, so this is absolutely fine. Um, we did have this positive and negative thing so let's let's set the direction let's let's set the um, initial position to always be uh, the initial direction to always be uh, exactly what we want it to be so let's let's set a positive value for both of those just for now just to check that it's not different in a negative value so still double see how it's still double here why would it be double let's think about that no it's probably all right actually because if it moves it moves across think about that it moves across no that's fine this is this comes down to the same thing we had with the snapping so the fact that the character sprite position is not on an exact 8 pixel boundary means that there's going to come a point when you move across actually you're going to set you're going to move across a little bit um, so there is going to be this double width thing as it goes down uh, that's fine that's to be expected question is why is it not bouncing off those surfaces that's that's the big question that's what it should be doing and it's not so we look at our if we look at our um, behavior. There we go. Uh, enemy one, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. So let's get rid of these now. We know we know that's fine. We don't need the ones in there. If the player collision is colorable, then we don't. But if, if it's not colorable, then we don't bounce. Otherwise, we need to negate it. Okay, let's just try putting zero in here. Let's just make sure that if we hit something, it will stop moving in the Y direction. Just make sure that the negation is working. The bounce is, itself is working. I think it is, but let's just double check it. There we go, so it is actually moving across. We should see it appear on this side here now. Okay. You get the colour row, but are you adding X to that? <clears throat> um, yes, so the enemy collision should do that. So in this... Uh... Get enemy collisions, yep. Enemy collisions is a macro, so it'll be in here. <clears throat> D 
the, this routine is what's doing that. So we get the we get the row using the Y register, um, and then we transfer the the X to the Y. It's actually in the accumulator. We stored it. We pushed it to the stack, <coughs> <coughs> and then we get the X value by doing that. Um, and that's what this routine is doing here. Um, this here. Actually, let's let's move this block here. So instead of drawing that all the time, we'll only draw it when there's a collision. Let's let's try that. No, that's actually only drawing it when it's at the edge, isn't it? So this should only well, let's try that. This should only draw when we're at the edge of the stream. Yeah, it is affecting the collision detection, but um, at the moment. Even if I turn it off. So they should only draw at the edges of the screen. It did collide with that edge there. That's good. Okay. Okay, let's let's turn the debug off. <coughs> let's go back to the behavior. Let's turn that off. Let's make sure it negates at that point. <coughs> oh, there it is. Wait a minute, that is just suddenly working. Maybe I'm just being stupid. Maybe I've just made a really dumb mistake. Maybe Bag of Potatoes is right. Maybe... Maybe I've done... Oh my god. It's bouncing off the debug, isn't it? Is it going to bounce off the top of the screen? No. Okay, so that's the problem. It should bounce off the top of the screen. Um... Okay. Okay. That's kind of half working. Let's get the X bounce working to see if it does the same thing. So this should be the same. Uh, actually, no, because we've still got one thing to debug here. So at the moment we're passing in a Y value here and we shouldn't be. Um, so, if the Y is FF, that means we were in the negative value. If we add 1 to it, it becomes 0. If we shift it to the right, it's still 0. If we transfer that to the Y register, that means the Y is 0. And that's fine. Okay. Oh, fucking hell. I've just seen... Oh my god, I'm such a dumbass. Um, okay, blah, 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 blah. We're not loading that collision point in. So when we transfer, when we actually do the, the Y position, we were only passing in zero or one. That's why the collisions were all off because they were only ever passing in zero or one. They weren't passing in zero or 20. Which is the bot uh, the top and bottom of the sprite so um hopefully this should be a little bit more accurate now bounce off the bottom bounce off the top so it's only doing collision in the vertical at the moment and when it comes over this side it's gonna it's gonna wrap um on that side unfortunately oh, it's a bit slow let me speed it up actually Yeah, it's, it's going to keep wrapping on that side because of the collision, because we've got no edge, screen edge collection. But let's just, oh shit, just make sure that it actually collides off things vertically when it does hit them. Um, which hopefully will be a bit more often than it seems to be. I can't believe that, it was such a dumb mistake to make as well. Come on. I feel like it's just going to keep hitting that area. Okay, I'm I'm fairly confident that's the thing, so I'm going to go ahead and do the same on the X bounds because it will give us a bit more chance of hitting the right values. Um, so the problem was is this line here. We needed to do this, and we weren't doing this. And again, we're not doing it here as well. 
Um, so we are we are transferring the. Um, hang on, blah blah blah. We we are grabbing the value in the accumulator, but then we're not turning that into a collision point. So we need to transfer it to the Y register. We need to grab that collision point for the X. And then we need to transfer it back to the accumulator and then load the Y with the actual vertical value that we need. I knew it would be something simple. And there we go, it's freaking working. I can't believe that. So the only thing we don't have now is the is the screen edges, but we'll we'll do that in a minute. I'm gonna take a short break while I, I I reflect on how stupid I've been for the past hour. Um and have a cigarette and go to the toilet and stuff like that. Um but when I come back we will we'll finally finish this. Um I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give up yet. This is we st it's still only half one. It's been a long time since I did some decent work on this, so I wanna I want to get these enemy kind of sprites working. Um, I want the enemy to be able to actually hit the hit the player sprite. What we'll do is we'll just add some simple collision in. Um, the collision will just check if this character um, has hit the sprite, and if it hits the sprite, it will just flash that sprite white for one frame or something like that. Um, okay, cool. Um, so give me five minutes, guys, and I'll be right back. Be right back. Right, I'm back, all refreshed. I need more wine. Normally I do a PC Engine, well, I don't normally, but I've done three or four times a PC Engine uh, gameplay at the end of the stream, but unfortunately I've not got it set up at the moment, because in building this thing, I've, um, this beast. I've got it all disconnected because I've been trying to find a way to implement the OSSC in this thing as well. So I want to put the OSSC inside here so I can stream uh, retro stuff <coughs> um, without having to mess around with any wires or anything. So I've not got it set up. So I'm just going to code until I fall asleep basically. So hope you're all ready for that. <coughs> <laughs> um, let's catch up with the chat. Put the PC engine on the key. Yeah, I'm sure I could, but I've got a real PC engine. Why would I? Why would I use the chameleon? It's my my little baby. I love this thing. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so we need we need to put some screen edge bouncing in here because at the moment it's not bouncing on the screen edge. So. Um, get rid of this debug now, I don't think we need this, get rid of that. So the check we were doing here was if, if the Y offset was negative, no, sorry, if the collision point was negative. Actually the collision point is already checking the edges of the screen, I think this is the problem. So when we do this get collision point, there is already some um, some capping of the edges here. So I don't think this is the right place to do it. So I'm going to remove it from here. Uh, this whole block. I'm going to move this instead. So what we can probably do is create another macro somewhere which just checks if it's at the edge or not. Um, yeah, I need to I need to get your your help on that because um, if I can get the Amiga core, how fast is the Amiga core on the on the, on the um, Turbo Chameleon? I mean, I have a Vampire V2 in my Amiga, but if I can if I can do the same stuff on the Turbo Chameleon, then I'm really not fussed. I will just get I'll, I'll just get rid of the Amiga completely, probably sell it or something. I, mean, I don't know how much the vampire goes for nowadays, but it cost me like 200 quid or something, two or 300 pounds. It was expensive. Um, okay, so we're bouncing if we hit something, but we should also probably bounce if we're at the edge of the screen. So before we even check, 
Um, let's put a do Y bounce in here. And let's check the Y position. So we know what our Y position is because we can just load uh, enemies. Uh, enemy position Y1, that's the one we want. And, uh, I think we'll probably move this into a... <coughs> Should we move this into it? No, this is this is a fairly specific thing just for this this thing. So, um, so the enemy will bounce if it's less than fifty. So if we uh, if it's if it's fifty or more, then we go to here. Otherwise will immediately jump to uh, do Y bounce. Actually, let's just jump straight to it there. Uh, jump, uh, do Y bounce, there you go. Uh, we also need to check if it's at the bottom. So the bottom is gonna be a little bit different. Um, and that's gonna be based on, uh, what's it gonna be based on? It's going to be very well. Let's let's not let's not add the actual offsets for now. Let's just do. Uh, so we need two hundred plus that. So it's going to be it's going to be two hundred forty eight. So that is going to be F eight like so. And if it's less than that, then we can. Sorry, if it's more than that, then we can do Y bands. Uh, let's try that. That should hopefully bounce off the bottom and the top a bit better now. <clears throat> no, it didn't bounce. Oh, weirdly, it seemed. No, is that bouncing because it's hitting something or is it bouncing because it's hitting the edge of the screen? <sighs> Just gotta wait for it to, to do its stuff now. I think I probably need to have two cigarettes when I go out because I'm immediately needing Darth Bear. I like how you call him Darth Bear. Do you know what? I'm actually just because just because we can, I'm gonna set his uh, color to be that <coughs> that weird thing. So uh, set enemy color. Let's pick a weird colour for him. Okay, so we've got this thing here. Let's uh, pick a colour that's kind of in the middle somewhere. Uh, that kind of weird... I want a yellowy colour, so I'm going to pick something around this location. I'm going to pick that one, actually. So this is yellow and light green. Okay, so that is uh, 7 and 13. <clears throat> oh actually that is pretty good I can't see any flicker on that that's probably the most stable colour we've had of the flickers so far Lime Bear he is Lime Bear yes okay so he's not bouncing off the edges here Let, let's put the X bounce in as well because um, let's copy that chunk of code in here um, and put it over here so it's a little bit different here because now we need to actually check um, the the right hand the left hand side and the right hand side. So let's check the left hand side first. Um, in fact, let's let's make this value based on on the two values. Let's let's make it a half value again. So let's take this value. So we take the upper byte. We're going to roll it to the right. So we're going to shift it to the right. Um, and then we're going to roll this value here. Is that right? So hang on. If I roll the value, is that putting it in the accumulator? Oh, God's sake, I can't. 
Do you know what? I can't think straight at all. This is not good. No, that's not, is it? Okay, so... That will. Okay, so now that's a half value. So, if the value is less than 12, then it's bouncing off the X. So let's do X bounce here. And the screen is 320 wide, the sprite is 24 wide. So that means it's 296 pixels across before it needs to bounce, plus the border, which is 24. So that is actually 320 again. So we need to compare this to 160, which is A0, okay. It's not bouncing off the bottom of the screen, that's what's bothering me here. It's bouncing off that side of the screen. Hopefully it bounces off this side of the screen as well. Okay, it's bouncing off the edges of the screen, that's good. We do need to add the, the kind of offsets for the, the sprite itself. Because the sprite isn't full 24 wide, so it's kind of bouncing a little bit early. Um, but it's not bouncing properly off the bottom of the screen. It seems to be bouncing off the top of the screen though. That's the interesting thing. So let's see what happens if it gets to the top of the screen. Yeah, it's bouncing off the top of the screen. It's just not bouncing off the bottom of the screen. Okay. So the bottom should be this one here. Uh... Have I worked that out right? Let's think about this. So if, oh no, I haven't worked this out right at all, have I? Because the screen is 200 high, um, but we're only doing 20, hang on, let me check. I can't remember if we're using two or three rows. I think we're using three rows on the bottom. Yeah, we're using three rows. One, two, three. So the screen is 22 high. So if we bring up the calculator, it's the easiest way. So 22 times 8. So that's the height of the screen. We need to add in the top area of the screen like that. But we also need to subtract the height of the sprite as well. So the sprite is 21 high. So the value is actually 21, which is CD. So that's way different. So if we put CD in here, we should see it actually bounce in the right places. Yep, see, as done is spot on with that. Here we are indeed only counting from the top, or we were only counting from the top, whereas now we're actually counting from the bottom, so. Okay, it's been 15 minutes since I had a cigarette and I already need one again. <clears throat> I'm gonna be smoking this heavily. <coughs> nah, that's better, that's better. Okay, cool. You get a cookie. Yeah, I don't know. I wish I had. Maybe I need a. Maybe I need that command, but I don't have it, unfortunately. So. Um, okay, so at the moment we're only bouncing off the colorable areas. So let's change that to bounce off the solid areas as well. Um, I've, I wish I could remember where the hell we stored those values. Player dot collision. Okay, so let's have a look at player. Play a collision solid. Okay, so let's change that to collision color uh, solid instead of collision colorable. And now it should bounce off everything um, that's solid rather than just the colorable areas as well. The invite to Discord seems outdated. Um, okay, let me try that. Um, okay, no, it works for me. Let me 
Let me create a new copy. It's uh, set this link to never expire. There we go. Oh no, it's picked the same one. No, it should be fine. The Discord one has picked the same. It's picked the same. The same URL, so it should be okay. Um, did I actually check that then? Yeah, that is working. It's just that some of the diagonals kind of make it do funky things. But I, I think I don't want to overcomplicate this this behavior. I think this is a fairly simple behavior. It shouldn't be shouldn't be too complicated. I think that's fine. I'm just going to watch it bounce around for a little bit. Um, As, I think as long as it doesn't get stuck in any area, and then it's fine. Um, I do like that colour though. I can barely tell it's flickering. It is flickering between two colours, but you can almost not tell, which is nice. Um, what was that? I got some kind of beep somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure what that was. Wow. I've got to say... Colt, your cat looks incredibly like my cat. Incredibly like my cat. Um, I don't know where that beep's coming from. Ah, oh, it's in. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm kind of alright with that. I think that's okay. So now we've we've got two enemies that are kind of doing slightly different behaviors. Now, the more we 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 make these behaviors, the easier the next one will get because the more we do, the the more we add these, the the more um, the more reusable code we'll have. So it's not not too much of a problem. Why doesn't it bounce from the rightmost platform? Um, I'm not sure what you mean there. Let's have a look. I think when it's moving in diagonals, it it, it seems to get confused because it's only checking just below and just to the le uh, just to the right or just to the left. It doesn't seem to be um, checking anywhere in between. So um, we could check diagonals, I guess, as well. Let's just double check. It seems that you, I mean, you might be right here. It's not checking quite. Yeah, see, it should have bounced a lot sooner off that, I think. Yeah, I think I think Acmuffin's right. I don't think it's checking to the right properly. It seems to be checking up. It seems to be checking down. At least... Okay, let's check on the platform. So... Definitely checking to the left, and it's definitely definitely checking down. To the right, it doesn't seem to be checking correctly. I'm not sure about up. Um, no, it's it's checking up as well because it did a bounce there, but to the right, it's not checking. So let's let's see what's going on there. No, I think you're right, Akmin. I think to the, the, the stuff to the right, it's not checking properly. So, let's have a look. So, enemy collision X is 23 on that side. Okay. Right, it's not right, yeah. I was beeping like crazy. I think it's Discord. Yeah, it is Discord. Um, I don't know how to turn that off. Ah, uh, it's just it's it's people in in general having a chat. 
Um, okay, so let's write the right. Yes, let's write the right indeed. Um, okay. Well, uh, the only reason that would be wrong is if, if, is if this value was wrong, and I definitely should be checking to the right. Um, I wonder if it's just because of the, the position of that, that thing, if it's because it's in the MSB area. Um, is it bouncing off anything else over this side? Is there any collision on the right hand side? See, it's not hitting anything, that's the annoying thing. Come on, hit something. There we go. Oh, no, see, it should have hit that, and it didn't. It didn't hit that, and it really should have been doing. Okay. Um, did we do anything in here? No, it only did that debug. There we go. I'm going to put that debug back in. I just want to see where it's checking when it moves in that direction. So, oh helps if I don't have it commented out. It's not going to do very much if it's not there. Um, why is it not drawing it now? Should be happening. That should be happening. That should not be happening. Hey, no, it's no problem. I'm glad that people use Discord. Um, the whole point of it is to to give people a way to connect and to. To talk about these things and it's uh, the more people we get in there the better because there's a lot of kind of various skill sets in there and it's really nice to have uh, beginners in there oh, what have I done I've broken something massively in here um, it's good to have beginners in there it's good to have uh, experienced people in there because they can all help each other and um, and it benefits everybody really so and there is a, a really good good range of uh, of people in there. There's there's plenty of um, there are plenty of very experienced people in there. I've completely lost my sprite now. I don't know what I've done. I've been too busy messing with this, and I've screwed something up. So let me. No, it's not that, is it? I've, I've done something in here. I don't know what I've done, but I've done something. Oh, I should have done a commit. That's what I should have done. Okay, get collision point. Blah, blah, blah. Don't need this section here. Okay, I'm going to get this working again so it's bouncing. And then I'm going to commit. I don't know why it's not bouncing on that side. That's the annoying thing. I'm I'm gonna just move the character over because I can do that without breaking anything. I'm gonna put the other character back in as well, just to make sure that one's still working. I'm gonna change this value just just a little bit just so that it's it's actually doing something um visible in a different area of the screen. <clears throat> Missing Y on collision point again. Okay, I'll check that in a second. Hang on, I just want to see. I really like that that color that it's picked up. That's really nice color. Because even in Vice that works, and that's unusual. I 
I, I can't work out what it's doing over there. Is it bouncing off the edge of the screen? Because here it's definitely bouncing off this 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 background. Um, I feel like as well as if it bounces, it shouldn't bounce again. So if it bounces off the X, it shouldn't bounce off the Y as well at that point. You just bounce off one and then leave it. Single step it might be a way to do it. Is that what you mean? It should only bounce off X or Y, it shouldn't bounce off both. I don't know what you mean by single step. Right, let's let's do a commit while we're while we're in a in a good place. Let's let's get it committed. New bouncy behavior, that will do. Oh, three commits on Doc. Wait, wait a minute. I had two when I started. How has somebody been committing to Doc Cosmos? Oh, actually, no. It's because it updates slowly, that's all. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can do that through the debugger. That's fine. Yeah, my commit messages have got kind of pathetic as I've, I've gone on with this. Um, okay, so let's... Wow, that's moving really quickly. Have I done something... Oh, no, there we go. All right. to actually work out where the hell I am in the code, don't I? Um, I'm just trying to put a breakpoint, what would be useful? Let's stick a breakpoint in here so we can actually see what's going on. Uh, actually, do you know what, I still need to get these set up and I haven't done it yet. I'm Kicking myself for doing this. In fact, that's getting written down. Top break in debugger. So I should be doing that really. It's, unfortunately, what I'm doing is, is a very kind of low tech way of doing this. So I put that in, and that lets me see in here. Uh, one C E B. There we go. I'll run that. Yeah. Okay. So this is our our breakpoint. Um, Or the collision at that point. Um, so what we need to know. Uh, let's think. Yeah. Do, do you know what? I actually. I don't even think we need this. I think what we need to do. Is we just need to do one or the other. Not both. I think the problem is it's trying to do both. So I'm just going to put some. Uh, I'm going to put a thing in here. I'm going to call it exit bounce. And then whenever we do the bounce, we're going to immediately. Exit bounce like that. I think that might help. Um, I'm going to. Uh, don't need to do it on that one. Okay. I'll try it and see what happens. Probably still this Y position over here. There's still something very weird going on with the Y position. 
Nah, there's still something odd going on. It's still... Think about what's happening. Okay, so the sprite is moving over in that direction. It finds a collision and then it reverses the direction. Oh, and it's gone off screen. It's disappeared. Where's it gone? I didn't even see where that went and it just disappeared. Okay, I don't think I don't think that's probably the right thing. Okay. Let's think about what's going on here. So the the biggest problem is I see when it comes over here. So it goes over here first and then it comes over to this side of the screen. And when it reaches this side of the screen, it seems to bounce extra through this area. See there? It does like a double kind of or even a triple or quadruple kind of shimmer through that area. Um, I'm not sure why. So it's moving in this direction. And it should... It should look in a different direction. So if it changes direction, the collision point should change. So the collision point is always going to be based on its two points and it's based on the direction it's moving. So if it's moving in this direction, it's going to be... Hang on, let me... Uh, where's the pause button? So if it's moving in, in that direction... Really? My pause button is broken. Oh. Oh, what, what have I done there? Now, did I cause that or. Oh, God's sake. Oh, why missing? Hang on, let me check that. What, missing Y on collision point again. Okay. point sure what you mean um, missing comma y on collision point again so collision point itself doesn't use any comma y so I'm guessing you mean within it within here um, which means a macro oops uh, I'm not seeing where the comma Y is. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. If you can clarify that, I can check it. But um, I'm not sure what you mean there. Although that would behave very differently because that would mean that the the sprites themselves are wrong. So what, I would be getting the collision for the wrong sprite. So. I'm kind of tempted to pass over what's going on with this sprite for now and look at it in a bit more detail when I'm slightly more sober um, and do something a little bit simpler like uh, sprite to character collision instead. Um, I don't think my head is quite right for, for looking at this. I'm just trying to think what's happening with that sprite. So it's getting over to that side detecting a collision on the left hand side so it's detecting a collision when it reaches here but then at that point it it should be saying okay reverse directions so when it reverses directions it should be checking a different collision on the other side oh thank you for the follow uh, I saw that briefly legally blind gamer thank you for the follow and very very much welcome to the stream Yeah, it does, but it seems to be 
It seems to be colliding vertically. Let me just check actually. Have I have I put the wrong collision? The collision's solid. And that's in the Y bounds. Is that in the X bounds as well? Oh my Do you know what? Ediferous, thank you. I think you just solved it with one simple comment that's just made me think about things indifferently. So it was colliding in the Y Y axis, um, but not in the uh, and not in the x-axis. I think that's that's solved. <laughs> it's what happens when you drink wine, especially when you start on doing it. Right, I'm gonna commit that again. Because that seems to be working. Yeah, the diagonals aren't working, but that's a whole different ball game, and we can look at that later. There still seems to be something on the right-hand side. But the left hand side seems to be colliding correctly now. So there's definitely something happening on, on that side. But remember we've got the MSB with X so that could be a whole different ball game. But you see when it hits this side it bounces straight off it. That's fine. It bounces off the edge, it bounces off the bottom, it bounces off the tops. So the only problem we've got is with this this block here when it hits this edge we've got a problem one of my favorite youtubers made his own 64 game oh you mean 8-bit guy yes I've I've seen I've seen that game uh, it's pretty good yeah it's going into the wall not stopping next to the wall it's based off the left edge not sure what you mean there, Andy. I'm not sure what you mean. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the offset. So this is the offset that we're using. This one here. Um, well, let, let's just try something. If I just increase that offset by 60, does that make any difference? Um, let's see where it's been used. Um, X barrels. Wait a minute. Oh no, that should be right. Okay. <laughs> Not 16 bits. I mean, thank you for the 16 bits, but give it me in two 8 bits. That's the way to do it. Yeah, I, I to be honest, legally blind gamer, I'm getting that way now. Um, it's been it's been two weeks since I actually drank alcohol, um, which is not a good sign. I mean, it shows how much alcohol I drink. If they, I take two weeks off and suddenly it starts hitting me massively, it shows how much I drink. Um, but yeah, I've had I've had like, like a bottle and two thirds of of wine, and I'm I'm starting to really struggle with this. So. Normally I'm a lot better than this. Oh, don't get me wrong, I like my I do like my 16 bit, but um 8 bit is where it's at. 8 bit you had to actually be good at game design. You had to you know, your games couldn't just rely on fancy graphics. They had to rely on good gameplay, clever use of the graphics. 16-bit is when it started becoming a bit too easy to just throw good design, uh, good good graphical design at something, um, and get sales through that. So, okay, so we've still got the problem with the right-hand side. We don't know why that is. I've set the value to 60 over that side, and it seems to break. I think it might be the MSB because I noticed it bounced off the bottom down there. So. Let's just keep watching it for a minute, see what happens. Yeah, see, no bouncing whatsoever on the right-hand side when it was in the MSB area. So, again, MSB area, no bounce. Unfortunately, I think it's stuck in that... Oh, probably in that loop now, so I don't think it's going to get out of that.
Right, I'm going to start playing around with the map a bit. So I'm going to load the map into a uh, sprite pad. Here we go. I'm just going to draw some random kind of blocks uh, down the middle. Oh, that was probably a bit thicker than I wanted. There we go. I think that's the right folder. I have been working on a few things, so hopefully that is the correct folder to put that into. There we go. Right, let's see what happens. Okay, so it does reverse direction eventually, but it's not straight away. So this is a good test, actually. So we can see what's going on here. It's definitely bouncing off this side. It's bouncing off the left side. But the right side seems to only bounce quite late for some reason. Um, so let's have a look in our behaviors here. This is our collision point X. So let's have a look at our X bounce. This is what we're concerned about. So we get the high bite. We... Oh, hang on. Uh, okay, so we... We shift the high byte and then we take the low byte and we roll it. So now we've got a half value. Then we check if we we're at the edge of the screen. So at this point we know this is working because we know the screen edges are working. load collision point X into the accumulator wait 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 that should not be happening that transfer Y to the accumulator is wrong that should not be happening I think we just I think that's it oh, God's sake that's such a dumb move so for some reason we had this in here I have no idea why we had this in here so we were transferring the the left and right value into the Y register, which allows us to get this collision point. So this table here, so zero or 60, which I'm gonna set back to 23 now. So the left hand or the right hand side of the sprite. So then we were loading that value up um, here. But then for some reason we were transferring the in we were just completely discarding this value and transferring zero or one into the accumulator so as that as Akmuffin says the right sound bounce, bounces when it hits the right side not the left side so i think what was happening was um it was checking checking the left side of the sprite for the right hand collision and that's what that is doing there so if i get rid of that that should hopefully fix it Hey, there we go. Awesome. Right, I know it's a little bit early, um, but I am two and one and a th one and two thirds of uh, a bottle in, and I really desperately need a cigarette. So I'm going to go for a 15 minute early cigarette, and we're going to continue. Now, normally I would stop around about half past two anyway, uh, but I want to continue. So I want to get the. Um, the, these sprite, uh, these projectiles hitting the enemies. I think what we're going to do is we're going to get them to change into a different state. So we'll create a stun state, um, and we'll get them to switch into the stun state when they get hit. Um, which, I mean, the way it's been going tonight, it's probably another three hours, but it should be only about half an hour. So, but I'm just going to keep going until I fall asleep. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, as long as I, yeah, exactly. It's until I feel tired and I fall asleep. You, you know, I slept for about two hours before the stream. So, yeah. And yes, commit. Thank you, Ediforus. That's a, a really good idea. Let's do a commit. Fixed horizontal collision. Stupid TYA. There we go. All right. So 
so it actually wasn't anything to do with this the the x the x m s b was happening anywhere so i'm gonna um just before i do that i'm just gonna un un oh pardon me i'm gonna undo that um and export export the map And then I'm going to have a quick break. So just make sure this bounces off this side. If it bounces off that side, I'll go for a break. If not, then I'm going to cry a little bit, I think. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to take five minutes, guys, and I'll be right back. Probably less than that, two minutes or something. All right, be right back, guys. And I'm back. I had two. <laughs> I feel quite dizzy after that. Although it might be the wine actually that's making me dizzy. I've had a lot. What are some ideas about what could be bouncing around instead of a bear? Or does the bear stay? Oh no, I don't want a bouncing bear. Um, this should be some kind of bat of some kind. I mean, not a bat obviously, but some kind of flying candy. Um, there's no animation in this. We'll add that into the behavior at some point. Um, in the same way, we've got the walking animation for the the main character, uh, for the not the main character, the 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 enemy behavior too. We'll have a an animation for this as well, which which just cycles through four or five frames or so. Um, so what I want to do now is is attempt. And I say attempt because I am starting to feel the alcohol a little bit um, to get these hitting the enemies. So we need to do um, some character to enemy collision. And that's going to be a little bit uh, tricky. Um, basically what we need to do is when the enemy whatever foray comes up with the yeah exactly um, when the enemy processes his update behavior um, there will be a check in here somewhere we will do we'll probably have a macro to do this because it makes sense because it will be it will be the same for every enemy um, they will check the sprite position against one of these uh, projectiles and if the two rectangles that come that that, that that make up the the eight by eight pixel area that the um, projectile takes up versus the sprite position that the sprite takes up, if they intersect in any way, then we will instead of well, no, actually we can jump to a subroutine um, which which handles the has hit so. Um, I'm just trying to think if that's something I feel comfortable doing after this much alcohol to be honest. It's hit me a lot stronger than it normally does. Um, yeah, I think it is actually. I think it's fine. I think we can do this. Oh, I feel cold. Let me turn my, turn my fans off so I'm, I'm not... That is really horrible outside at the moment, so... Um, yeah, so yeah, give Furo some ideas if you've got some ideas for what, what you think this, this flying enemy should be. Um, but we definitely have something in place now. So the way I expect this to work is um, each level will have um, a queue of enemies. So, so for instance, let's say we're, we've got a queue of 20 enemies. So the, the goal of this particular level is to clear 20 enemies. Now we can only have five enemies on the screen at one time. Um, so the level will start by taking the first five off that queue and spawning them on the screen. When one of those enemies is killed, the next enemy will be spawned on the screen. So it may be that the first five enemies are just simple walking enemies like this. And when you kill the first of these walking enemies, then the sixth enemy will spawn on the screen, and it could be anything. It could be one of these walking enemies. It could be a it could be a flying enemy like this. Um, so it's important that we come up with 
enough variation of enemies that the that the levels seem um, different and, it, and and kind of exciting to play. They should be exciting. They should be yeah, interesting enough to play, I guess. Um, is it going to be a pain if the sprite changes sides with each frame as the wings move? I I wouldn't think so. I mean, we can we can set a kind of collision rectangle, which 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 kind of represents the majority of the sprite. Um, the wings could be the wings could kind of intersect um, with the background a little bit more. It's it's not too bad. Single chewing gum like double bubble looks like that within the package. Uh, I don't know what double bubble is, unfortunately. Uh, the wrapper looks like wings. Oh, I do know what you mean, actually. Yes. That would be kind of cool. I think I know what you mean, yeah. Like the, the twists on the end of the wrapper would look really cool as um, as wings, actually. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's a good good point. I like that one. I've got to say, I really like this color. This this. Um, I mean, I don't know how it looks on the stream. I can't really see the stream, but um, in Vice, it looks really stable. I can I can barely tell it's flickering at all. In fact, I can't tell it's flickering. Uh, thank you for the follow. I really hate Mondays. Yeah, me too. Um. Yeah, I, I I think this is a colour we definitely need to stick with because this is this is really good. Um in my search for super bubblegum. Okay, let's give that a try. <laughs> okay, you mean you mean this sort of stuff. Okay, yeah, I can I can see how that would work, and I, 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 yeah, the the twists on the end would would definitely work as as a uh, as wings. Okay, let's have a look at getting this kind of collision working. So, what do we need to do? We need to check if two rectangles are intersecting. So, the way you do that is you take the X positions and you subtract them from each other and you take the Y positions and you subtract them from each other and the end result will be a value that's either negative um, if the value is negative, I think if the value is negative uh, what does that mean you need to take the absolute value no hang on let me think rectangle intersect so rectangle intersect it means that if you subtract the x values that the absolute value i.e. if it's positive you make it uh, sorry if it's negative you make it positive so it's always a positive value so if it's negative 3 you make it 3 if it's negative 4 you make it 4 um, the absolute values of the difference so it's the difference between the x's and the difference between the y's if that value is less than the width of the smallest piece, i.e. the projectile, so less than 8, uh, then they're intersecting. But no, that, see that would still intersect if it's more. I think this might be a bit too much for my head at the moment for maths. Um, Hang on, let's just think about the X. So if a projectile is 8 pixels, so if the projectile is, is outside the range to the left, then it would be minus 8 or more difference. So the difference would be 8 or more. Minus 8, so... Okay, so if we think of it in, in, in relation to the sprite width, you think about an X, X position of the projectile. If we take the difference between the, the sprite X and the projectile X, if it's less, so if we take sprite X minus projectile X. If it's less than zero, 
No, if it's less than minus 8, then the projectile is not hitting. If it's more than the sprite width, then it's not hitting. Uh, actually, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. Let's give it a try. So we need to do this on a sprite update. So whenever the sprite updates, it needs to check itself against all projectiles that are currently active on the screen. So we're only ever going to have four projectiles. So there's only four things it needs to check against. <clears throat> so first of all, let's check if they're consecutive in memory. I think they should be. Projectile X. So here we go with projectile X. So this is what we need to be checking against these values and these values. So this is our lower byte. This is our higher byte. So they are consecutive in memory. Uh, same with Y as well. We don't care about the Y0 and the X0 because they're, they're fractional values just used to kind of slow things down and make things a bit more accurate. <coughs> Oh, hang on, let's check out these links. Uh, the green apple. Yeah, that's not loading for me. What's that? Bubble Bubble. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Well, which Bubble Bubble version is that from? That looks like a... Uh... I'm going to say that's... Is that the NES version? No, that's not the NES version. There's too many colours in that. Not, but I'm not sure what version of Bubble Bubble that is, but uh, I mean, this is something we need to look at as well fairly soon. We need to start thinking about um, power ups, but we haven't got the. Um... Oh, I was hoping that would jump straight to the thing. We don't have the the floor effects going on as well, um, so that's something we need to do at some point. We need to get the floor effects working so these get coloured. Um, so we can affect these kind of behaviours a little bit differently. So if something is walking on the floor, then it should also react to anything that's underneath underneath it. Um, flying, not so much. Um, but we also need to be able to change... At the moment, our, our projectiles are all yellow. Um, we might want to be able to change that to freeze or or uh, bounce or things like that. So <clears throat> that's another another area we need to touch on at some point. <clears throat> but for now, let's let's have a look at getting the um, uh, the collision working correctly on this side. So this needs to be a macro. So we need to check in a macro. Let's make a new macro down here. Let's call it um, has hit projectile. So the job of this macro is going to be to take the, the current enemy position. Um, Such as this. Let, let's start with the Y because the Y is going to be the easy one. We're going to take the enemy position and we're going to check it against all the projectiles. Um, if any of the projectiles do hit the enemy, then we need to do two things. Firstly, we need to remove that projectile because that projectile has hit something so it's no longer active it needs to disappear uh, secondly it needs to return from this this macro um, with some kind of flag to say that it's here so we'll use the carry carry flag because that's that's the easiest way of doing it so if the carry flag is set um, then we've we've hit something if the carry flag is clear then we've not uh, and the macro itself will be responsible for removing um, that projectile. Um, I'm actually going to, at this point, start using a subroutine here as well. Um, because I don't want this... This is going to be repeated a lot. And and the, what it's actually going to check against is... It's going to be quite a large loop because it's going to have to check against every projectile. So we want a, we want a subroutine which does this for us, rather than keep um, keep repeating the same code over and over again. 
So let's have a think about this. So let's, let's create a subroutine. So if we call the subroutine um, check versus projectiles. I just need to make sure that this is imported in the correct way. I do, yeah, enemy macro. So it's imported, so this should be fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of happy with that being there like that. Okay. So at the moment, we're just going to check the Y position. Um, and we already have... We already have the X, which tells us the, the, the index of the enemy we're going to check again. So actually, that probably should go in here, like so. We'll use the X register as our our kind of enemy thing, and we'll do. So this kind of seems a little bit counterintuitive. We're we're calling a macro, but then we in the macro we're immediately calling this. Um, I'm gonna. I, I like to keep it the same macros throughout because I don't want to confuse. Uh, I don't want to confuse these kind of things in the in the behaviors. I, I want. I want any time we do anything that's that's kind of outside of the behavior to be a macro, um, and all it means is that the, it will just put this in in its place. Um, the actual check itself relies on the X register being the, the character that we the, the enemy that we want to check. Um, but it means that this code will only be in memory once. We won't be implementing it ev for every macro. These could also be the same. I mean, if we do start running out of memory, um, when we start doing our 16 kilobyte check towards the end of the project, we can start looking at these functions uh, and potentially potentially switching some of it out for subroutines. Um, the reason I don't is because of these parameters. It's nice to be able to pass parameters in like this and um, not have to kind of switch registers around and store things in memory. Um, so, so in general, I like to keep the behaviors as macros because it gives us a lot more flexibility with things like, um, like parameters. Um, but with this behavior, I think this is going to be quite a long, uh, with this check versus projectiles behavior, this is going to be quite a long piece of code. So I don't want to repeat this for every enemy. This is going to be something that's going to happen all the time. Um, and I, I don't want it to be lots and lots of duplicate code. So we're going to do this in, in separate pieces like this. Um, okay, so... We need to check against the projectiles. So let's go and have a look at the projectiles. Let's have a look how we can check against them. So projectiles have their own variables. Player one projectile, player two projectile. They are consecutive. So there's no need for us to actually check if it's player one or two. That doesn't matter at this moment in time. Uh, we will need to know which player it is when it comes to adding the score. Um, but for now, let's just get it working. We can figure out the, the, this kind of which player has has caused it at a later date which will just be based on the loop value so if we look at the loop we're going to go from zero to three so basically if bit uh, let's think bit one is set then it's player two if it's bit zero if bit one is clear then it's player one and so on so it's going to be easy enough to do to do the, the let's get rid of that bit there it's going to be easy enough to do the um, the scoring routines later on. Um, so, let's, with that in mind, we're only concerned about the Y at the moment. So, so this is all we care about these these values here. So, this particular value is the one that we care about. So, let's put this into uh, enemy macros. There we go. Right, this is what we need to check again. So we need to check this value against this this value here. So the way to do this is we if we've got two y values, we basically want to know if the difference between those values is either less than the width the, the height of the projectile or it's more than the height of the sprite. 
So let's take let's let's think about this step by step. So um, the difference will be we take the sprite position. And we subtract so at the moment we're just gonna we're gonna check against the first projectile so we're just checking against player one projectile we'll, we'll turn this into a loop in a minute let's just get it working with first projectile so we're gonna check against um, the first projectile so we take the position of the enemy we subtract the first projectile. So if, uh, let me think about this. Thank you for the follow Anthony Pereira 88. Thank you very much. Welcome to the stream. I'm in the middle of a very drunken kind of mathematical quandary at the moment, which is fun to say the least. Um, so I guess the first thing we need to do is compare it with the width of the projectile. So if we compare it with F8 because we've we subtracted. Mm, no, is this going to work actually? Mm. Instead of thinking what's not collided, we need to think of what has collided. So if it has collided, then the difference between the widths, uh, the difference between the, the two Y positions will be. Let's think the height of the sprite. Or at most the height of the sprite. At least. Minus eight. <clears throat> so let's actually. So we add eight to it. So now, if our sprite is anything over, the height of the sprite plus eight, then we've not collided. <coughs> um, so that would be the carry is set. So bunch of carry set here. Oops. Oh, I cannot type at all. There we go. <clears throat> and let's do some simple, simple debugging here. So let's uh, load the accumulator with one. Ah, uh, good night, Andy. Thank you for joining the stream and thank you for your help along the way. Very much appreciated. <clears throat> okay, this is quite a simple routine, but what it should do is set the enemy color to white if if the Y position is correct. So as soon as the Y position of a projectile reaches the same level as a sprite, it should set the enemy to Y. So let's have a look. <clears throat> Something has failed. Uh, play one projectile because that should be player. <clears throat> Uh, play one projectile, that should be correct. Why is that not? Oh, because that's actually not player one projectile, it's projectiles. <coughs> okay, so... The, oh, the problem is, is we've got some color for it. Let's turn the color flickering off. So 
we don't get confused by those because we'll only see it very briefly turn to white we need to make sure that it's always going to be white we can turn that back later on because uh, it's an update enemy color there we go Okay, that didn't do anything. So this is player one projectile. So this should be should be the one that's acting. So I might have to think about what's going on here. Oh, I know what's going on. We're not actually calling the routine. That's why. Uh, has hit projectile. There we go. Um, okay, so let's do it on both both enemies. Do it on the on update. Do it after the color set, so it makes sense. Um, yeah, I think I think this is probably going to be the last. Oh, there we go. See. Doesn't set that one though, so, so the collision isn't quite right over that side. But we definitely hit this one because it's gone to white. So let's let's just restart. So let's wait for that guy to move up the top. Okay, so it set this one, not the other one. Um, we should be checking both. I don't know why it's not checking this one down here. So let, let's just turn off the one for for this. Uh, that one there. Let's just go and double check that nothing's set in the colours. So on spawn we set the colour. Then we don't set the colour again. So, so it should be fine at this point. Um, I don't see anything that's set in the colour. Okay, so the black one should not change now because we've turned it off. The white one, uh, the yellow one, however, should be changing and it's not. We need to look at why that's not happening. Um, so we take the Y position of the enemy, and we subtract the Y position of the projectile. And then we add eight and then if the value is more the resultant value is more than 29 which is the height of the sprite plus the height of the projectile then we're not hitting otherwise we have hit and we should be setting the enemy color which is what we're doing here <coughs> oh we need an rts there this is a subroutine this is not a macro so we do need to return from the subroutine here so let's just check that that Works. Okay, it's still not setting the color to white though, and we should be doing. Okay. Let's have a think about that. So. Only the first projectile is working, so as long as we just do one at a time, that should be affecting it, and it's not. For some reason, it's not affecting that sprite. We're using X here, so this is fine. We put this in the beginning here, just to confirm that it is actually working on both sprites. We should see both go to white. Well, the one that's yep. So that's being checked, and it goes to white. Interesting. Okay, so we are taking the white position. 
<clears throat> hmm. So I'm I play a projectile. Add eight. Okay, for some reason this math isn't working. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm getting to the end of my, my kind of abilities tonight. Anybody can see why that might not be working? Um, okay, so... Pardon me. So the the sprite is at the bottom, right? So let's say let's say its x position is c zero, its y position is c zero. Um, the projectile would be uh, let's say b zero. Doesn't really matter, does it? Um, uh, let's say b eight. So if it's b eight, then that would be zero eight. We add 8 to it, which is 1, 0, and then we compare it to 29, which is, well, it's 1, 1D, one isn't it? So, it's more than 1D, and then it goes there, which is not. So, it should be setting that. That's kind of strange how that's not setting it. Hmm. Okay, um... Hmm. Have a look at that again. That, that should be working, I'm not sure why that's not working. So we should only be caring about the Y position, and basically as soon as I fire this, at that point, this is within the Y range of this this enemy, so this should be turning white, um, but it's not, and I want to know why. So I, I'm going to double check the enemy behavior just to make sure there's nothing else in here um, which is setting the color. So this is the only place that we set the color. So if I turn that off, what happens? Do I still get a yellow yellow sprite, or do I get a different color sprite. There's something else setting that value is what I want to know. No, nope, we get a black sprite. Okay, we get a black sprite and yet we don't have any effect on it. Okay, so let's put that back. That's fine. So it's not the enemy behavior itself that is setting the color. So that means this check is failing at some point. <clears throat> Hmm. I see a projectile. It's definitely being called. Oops, I'll close the enemy behaviors. Uh, on update happens every time. That's hit projectile. Okay, so that calls this macro. Why is that not working? Any reason why that would fail? Because again, th this function is definitely being called, right? So if we put if we put that there and we run that, we should see the the character at the bottom go go white. Uh, y increases down the screen. 
um, and the y coordinates of the sprite are in the top left. Uh, so the the zero zero of the sprites in the top left. Um, and unfortunately, well, the, the sprite and oh, that's a really good point. You've got a very good point there. So while you don't know what's going on, one thing you have pointed out is that actually our enemies use sprite space and our projectiles do not use sprite space. Our projectiles use um, non-bordered sprite space. So what we need to do before we do this is actually subtract uh, the border from the enemy position. So in the terms of uh, the y position we need to subtract hexadecimal 32 or 50 from it um, because this accounts for the border at the top of the screen it is good to get outsider ideas because Edif force doesn't really know Commodore 64 but he's able to he's able to give us an idea which has made me realize that actually the projectile screen sp the projectile space and the sprite space while they have the same um, scale, as in one pixel is one pixel, their their offsets are slightly different. So we have to we have to subtract fifty from the enemy position for it to be lined up correctly with this. This works now. You're a godsend, of course, honestly. <laughs> you are a godsend, my man. Thank you very much. There we go, that was it. So um, I'm gonna put a little tip here of subtract, subtract border. Uh, you're a genius, thank you very much. Because you're thinking about it geometrically, so you're thinking, well, why doesn't it work? The only reason it can't work is because the geometry is wrong and the geometry is wrong because the origins of both, both coordinate spaces are in different places. So, so yeah, a good, good, good game. Honestly, very good game. That would have kept me awake. I would have been awake for a long time after that. So with that in mind, we need to do the same thing with the X position. So, um, uh, duh, duh, duh. we check the Y. If it's not within Y range, then we don't need to do any more checks. If it is within Y range, then we now need to check the X position as well. So we'll check the X position by taking that value in the upper value. We're going to do the, the same half value again here because it's the easiest way to deal with this. Um, we're going to shift everything to the left. Um, then we're going to take the, oops, we're going to take the, the lower byte and we're going to roll it to the left. And that now gives us the half value. So now we need to subtract half of the border, which is 0C. Oh, I turned off. There we go. Um, and then we need to subtract the player projectile, um, which we're going to have to half as well because the pro player projectile is also going to be in. Uh, in, in this half hour so we'll, we'll push the current value that we've got on the accumulator here uh, and then we'll do the same with this we'll take the oops we'll take the the x2 sorry um, we'll shift that to the left then we'll load x1 and, and roll that to the left uh, and then we'll store that in, we'll use temp10 again because that's our nice nice thing. Um, then we'll pull from the stack again. Um, uh, what do we need to do? Then we need to we pull from the stack. So we need to set the carry bit and subtract temp10 from it. Uh, add eight to it no we need to we're using half value so we need to add four to it we're using x position so it's 24 plus 8 which is two zero but we're using half value so it'd be one zero cool 
Cool. That should be right, I think, now. Let's give that a try. Oh, no. Huge failure. Oh, I, for some reason I put an O there instead of a zero. Okay, so that hit when it shouldn't have hit. Um, let's make this a temporary flash. So let's... Um, enemy behaviors. Let's set the enemy color there. And let's do this. Turn it back on for player, for enemy behavior one as well. So now we should see a flash of white rather than it stay white. to slow this down okay it's happening way too it's happening at the wrong time isn't it yeah it's happening before it gets over there so I think the X is wrong here that's fine so let's have a look at what's happening on the X so this is the Y um, I'm just going to separate it like this just so I can tell what's going on. Yeah, there we go. So, with the X position, we're taking the upper byte, we're shifting it to the left which is the wrong way because we're doubling it. It should be to the right and there's the problem. I think that's the issue. So I'll get it loaded up and then I'm going to slow it down a little bit just so we can see what's going on here. So. Still was a bit soon, but it's definitely better than it was. It's not hitting that one though. Oh damn it. I really, really, really wanna I want to nail this before I go to sleep, so... It's, it's kind of almost there, that's the annoying thing, it's, it's not... It's not far off. Okay, let's let's think about this logically. So, ah, oh God, the maths maths is hard when you're drunk. He says, filling up his wine again. I'm gonna finish the bottle before I go. So I've got I've got one glass now. I've got another glass when I'm done. So we take the enemy Y position, we subtract the border. That's that has to happen. There's no no way around that. As Edifor said, you know the the coordinate spaces were not mis were not aligned. This aligns the coordinate spaces. We subtract the we get the difference between the two. Um, if the if the difference is negative, well, we add eight to it as well. So now we have a value between zero meaning that the, 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 the projectile vertically is just above uh, the sprite, but touching the sprite. Um, and we compare it to 21 plus eight, which means we're comparing the, the position, hang on, if we add eight. And if the, if the sprite was touching the bottom, that would be 21. So this is, this is fine as well. This seems correct. 
Um, there are 29 positions in which that sprite can be within uh, that projectile can be within that sprite. So from the bottom edge, i.e. position seven um, within the, the projectile, um, at the top edge, all the way down to position zero on the bottom edge of the sprite. So that's 29. That's that's the width of the sprite plus the width of the uh, the height of the sprite plus the height of the projectile. So I think this is the problem. We're doing something wrong here. Um, so if we look at the x x position, so we're getting the x. The we are using um, shift to the right and roll to the right to actually get the half value of the sprite. So we take the upper byte, we shift it to the right, then we roll the lower byte, which will give us the half byte because the carry will be sent into the the, the lower nibble uh, to the lower. 8 bits. Um, then we subtract the border which is 24 but because it's half bytes we need to sub because we've halved the value we need to just subtract 12. Then we do the same oh and there we go I see the problem. See simple x2 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 x1. Now the problem is is we've done x2 twice we should do x1 there we go. <sighs> This works, I'm going to have a cigarette. Okay, so let's see, this should now... Let's see, it's still affecting too early, the X is happening way too quickly. The Y seems spot on though, because if I fire from here... The Y seems spot on. The X, however, is not quite right. And you can see this guy bouncing around here isn't right as well. Oh, this guy stayed white, that's not good. I do LDA and LSI. Yeah, because the the LSR is basically shifting um, bit zero of this value. Bit bit zero of the accumulator goes into the carry bit, which means when I do this it gets it gets pushed into bit seven. Um, it's just a trick to, to basically do 16-bit shifting. Um, okay, where am I storing that? So I'm storing a half value here. Retrieving a half value. And this comparison might be wrong. So, I should be comparing to the width of the sprite, which is 24, plus 8, which is 2, 0, but halved, which is 1, 0, so this should be right, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, take the half with the projectile, doesn't include the border, push it to the key. No, sorry. Pull from the accumulator and subtract the width, the, subtract the position of the projectile. It has been halved by that value. Let's have a look what's happening again. Let's slow it down a little bit more. Let's see where the the um, the collision actually happens. If I go down to here, because we were getting no collision on this guy, that's the funny thing. You can see it seems to be about the width of the character, but... It's happening too early. So it only goes white for about the width of a character, but it's it's too early. Which makes me think it's a border thing. Take the enemy position, half it, subtract the border width. 
take the projectile, subtract that. Uh, hey, wait a minute. I'm doing this all backwards, aren't I? There we go. Easy. Yes, I'm doing it back to front. That's why. Okay. Uh, no, that's correct. Subtract. Take the position. Position. Subtract the projectile. Enemy. Subtract projectile. Enemy. Fall from the accumulator. Subtract the projectile. So the difference between those two. I mean, this feels like it would fix if I just did that. But that is not a solution because to me, mathematically, that makes no sense. Yeah, I thought the subtraction was the wrong way around as well, um, but it seems like that's probably not the case. Um, See, that's really frustrating. That makes no sense as to why that works. Mathematically, that is wrong. But for some reason, that works. Oh, damn it. So we, this ad here is the width of the projectile. The width of the projectile is in half X space, so this should be 0, 4. Um, oh, damn it, why is that working? Right, do you know what? I'm going to have a cigarette while I think about this. So I'm going to be back in uh, two minutes. Cheers, guys. Back in a sec. Ah, I can't think of what this is. Um... I can only think that the border must be wrong, but the border should be 24. Yeah, it is it is really close. The actually I wanna try vertically. I wanna see if the if the the error is the same vertically. If the error is the same vertically then uh, God, how am I going to test this? I guess if I could get it up on this platform. Uh, no. I'm going to have to do it from here, I guess. Yeah, that's going to reach. Okay. Yeah, it's the same vertical as well. Too soon vertically and too soon horizontally as well. Um, I feel like this value needs to be plus 8 in both directions, but that's uh, doesn't make any sense to me why that would be the case. Which makes me think the border is incorrect. Um, this is the last bit. If I get this bit done, I can go to bed happy and I can sleep. Otherwise, if I don't get this right, I'm going to be up all night thinking about this. I say all night, there's not much other night left. Let's do the horizontal first, because that's the easiest one to to, to to test. So, okay. We take the difference between the two X positions. If the projectile is 8 pixels to the left then the difference will be minus 8 and at that point it should not be or, or it should be is the border basically 
Which makes me think it's that it makes me think it's that border thing. Because by this point here, by this line here, we have the difference between um, half values of the player projectile and the player position, uh, the enemy position. Uh, the subtraction is happening in the right way because we're pushing to the accumulator, uh, pushing the accumulator onto the stack, and we're pulling the accumulator from the stack and subtracting the projectile. So we've if the enemy is greater than the projectile, then the subtraction should give us... Hang on. Is this just because I'm doing this? I think Agamemnon might be right. I think, I think the subtraction is happening the wrong way. Let me think about this. Right, so position is 8 and we minus... So if, imagine if the position is... It is, it's the wrong way around. It's the fucking wrong way around. Oh my god, I don't believe this. Okay, so. We take the position and we subtract the projectile. And the projectile, uh, the position is at 8 and the projectile is at 0. And the value is 8. It's not... We shouldn't be adding a value. We sub should be subtracting. That's what the value, the problem is here. completely wrong. Let me think about this. If the enemy is at 8 and the projectile is at 0, we are subtracting the projectile from the enemy. Taking the enemy, we're subtracting the projectile. So eight minus zero is eight. More wine, more wine, more wine, more CBD. I feel like it is subtract. I feel like it is. It is that. I'm gonna leave the Y for now. I'm just gonna see what happens with this. Maybe it's just the X that I'm getting wrong, and I'm not. I've not got the kind of the focus to be able to deal with them both at the same time. No, that's way too early. Look at that. It's happening much earlier than it was before. So it's not that. Okay. So again, think again, okay, enemy is at position 8, projectile is at, let's say, position 4. Um, they're definitely colliding because the projectile is 8 wide, so if it's at position 4, then the overlap is 4 pixels, right? 8 minus 4 is 4. Ignore the fact that we're using half values here, so let's, let's add 8 to that, so that becomes... 12 so that should be colliding let's say it's not colliding so let's say the the sprite is at 10 and then the sprite and then the projectile is at zero so that becomes a, a difference of 10 10 minus zero is 10 which is what we're doing here we're taking this value which you push to the accumulator which is the enemy position 
uh, and we're subtracting the player position room. So it's now 10. So if we do 10 plus 8, we get 18. Which is wrong because that's saying it's on the other side. I feel like this is subtract, but I feel like there's something wrong here. Um, honestly, I think I might be at the point where I have to stop. Um, but I have still got more wine, so let's get through the wine. Let's see if we can figure it out before we before I finish the wine. So let's pour pour my last glass. Oh, you know, I had a feeling before I started this this section that it was going to be a bit difficult. Mathematically, it's, it's, it's it seems really simple, but for some reason, it's not it's not making sense in my head. Okay, um, yeah, it is it is very close, and I I don't know why. It's not correct. I mean, I, I feel like if I add 8 to this, then it will be fine. Uh, and I would have to do the same up here as well. Um, but I, I can't... My, my head can't figure out why that would be the case. So I might need to draw this on paper tomorrow and figure it out. But if I can't figure it out now, that's what I will do. Um, I'll draw a little diagram. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It should be a subtract, but it, it for some reason that's not the case. It seems to be incorrect. Let's actually try flipping the subtract around rather than rather than changing this to a subtract. Let's try flipping this around. Um, so instead of doing this, we'll store this in temp ten. Um, Actually, no, let's do this the other way around. Let's let's do that first. Let's get rid of that. So we're doing that. We're storing it in temp 10. Then we're taking the... No. Hang on, let me think. Push that to the accumulator. Okay, let's try that. Let's do it the other way around instead. I think uh, this is the same though. I think this is the same as doing the subtract. I think we're going to get the weird. Um, Oh no, that's annoying. <laughs> See, that looks right. That's... Okay, let me check from the other side as well, because... That's right, isn't it? I just, yeah. Ackham Finn was right all along. This is the the subtraction was the wrong way around. But for some reason, I, I don't know why my head couldn't figure it out the other way around. But because that's spot on, it's not working vertically. But that's because we don't have the same same thing vertically. So let's let's do the same thing vertically. Okay, so uh, we need to start by loading this value. Hang on. Yeah, we need to load that value. No. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, we need to store that in temp 10. Then we need to load that value. Then we need to subtract temp 10 from it. Oops. Okay, let's check again. So, 
we should see okay I don't know why that's staying white that's a bit weird oh I know why that's staying white that's because the projectile has disappeared at that point so if the projectile hits the floor so I he should probably go white when he hits this area yeah okay that's just because the projectile is inactive um, because it's disappeared at this point, but we're not actually checking for an activity on the projectiles uh, That's fine. We can check that at a later date. That's fine um, Holy shit, this is actually working there Okay, so as the last thing that we'll do now, so now this is working um what we need to do is we need to get it to check every projectile so at the moment it's just checking one projectile we're not using the Y register here so what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, we're gonna set the Y to zero um, and we're gonna set a loop up here So anytime we check against a play projectile, we need to check against comma Y. I only just figured out how the Y collision code works and now you're changing it. <laughs> yeah, I had it back to front. I, I, for some reason, I don't know why that, that wasn't working. In my head, for some reason, was not seeing this correct. Um... So at this point we'll increase the Y, compare it to 0, 4, if it's not equal go back to loop uh, and we'll do the RTS here, we don't need, actually we'll keep this RTS here, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll move that though. Okay, we need to do some changes here. Uh, call that collide. And call that collide. And put collide in here. Probably don't need this one here actually now. So this will check every projectile. So now we should be able to do the same thing with player two, which we couldn't do before. Uh, so, so previously we only had player one's first projectile working. Um, oh, now they're both on white. Okay, let's check that out. And it needs to be the opposite because now we're doing only if it's actually hit. Okay, so player one projectile should still work and it's working way too soon, which is incorrect. So let's just reverse those changes. Think about this a little bit. Okay, so it hasn't hit, so it goes to here. It hasn't hit, so it goes to here. So at this point, we need to do the jump to collide. How long have I been streaming? Six hours, that's not bad. Relative dress is illegal, jump too far. Really? Why is that suddenly... Oh, uh, bridge on equal loop. Nah, really? That's too far? Oh my god, only just. Okay, fine. So again, I, I explain this every time, but basically you invert the loop that you want to do, you jump to a new label, 
you put a jump there and then you put the label here like that. Uh, oops. <laughs> and I'm not seeing anything there. What is going on? Alright, let's just reverse all of this. Let's keep reversing until we get it working. hitting because our collide is wrong um, because they're always exiting collide should be here um, that should be there like that and that should be jump to collide oh my god I can't type straight always hit if I've not hit go to here uh, it should be that one like so uh, thank you for the follow the legendary Josh Wolf Josh Wolf dude C64 and assembler epic yes indeed there's not enough people doing C64 and Assembler, and the people that are doing it don't stream, so they should stream more. Um, let's have a look. This is looking pretty good actually, so let's uh, do a double check at 20% speed just to make sure. So again, we've got the problem that the, when the sprite disappears into the ground, it's still technically active as far as the collision is concerned. Um, but we can check that in a minute anyway. Um, let's just get it working so far. That's accurate enough for my liking. We can play around with that more at a later date um, to re reduce the kind of the width that the the width that the sp the enemy sprite itself takes up. Um, so let's also check that the it is still working for player two um, which it should be doing which it is which is perfect which means our loop is working again we've got loads of sprites kind of uh, en life ended on the floor here they're kind of despawned at this point here um, but they're still stored in memory at that point so so we can deal with this in two ways we can either set the sprite itself to be in a different place or we can just check that the sprite is active as well. So uh, I'm pretty sure in the projectile somewhere we probably have type or something. I'm guessing. Um, yeah, we'll we'll check the projectile type. I think that's probably enough actually. So if we uh, in here we do, um, oops. It's always the 80s somewhere on the internet. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, that player one. Oops, player one, not player two. Oh, God's sake, put the one in the wrong place now. There we go. And if it's zero, then we jump straight to this point here. I'm going to call this skip and I'm going to change the the points in here because skip makes more sense
so now we should see that the the sprites aren't gonna cause problems uh, but there's a bug in it I think you should be comparing with 21 instead of 21 plus 8 um, let me think about this no because we're adding um, we add 8 as well so when we take the difference between the two the difference could be minus 8 um, and and still be collision minus 7 minus 8 uh, so we have to add the width of the the projectile in the width the projectile is eight wide so if we don't add that projectile width in then then our value will be minus eight to um, minus uh, sorry minus eight to 21 um, but obviously that's a lot more difficult to check than <clears throat> than if we just did a comparison um, against from 0 to 21 plus 8 so we just add 8 to it so the, the reason we we compare against that is because of that the width of the projectile so the the the, the valid range of collisions is not 21 which is is the uh, sorry this is the height <coughs> um, which is the height of the sprite um, but it's 21 plus 8 because you need 21 plus 8 uh, pixels on one side as well uh, you don't need it on the other side because if you move the if you move the sprite to the very edge of that it's 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 immediately uh, as it reaches position 21 it stops colliding so you need the the projection of uh, of both the the height plus the height of the projectile as well <clears throat> otherwise you'd hit the enemy if the projectile is below the enemy as long as it's less than the projectile height below it I think this is correct as it stands. I will do some checks tomorrow just to make sure when I've had less, when I've sobered up a little bit. <clears throat> I have had two bottles of wine so far. <coughs> so I'll check again in the morning just to make sure. But um, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Edaforce. I just need to double check it. But I think it's probably all right as it is. Um, I need to check. So... At some point we will we'll do a check of um, or I will do a check of the projectiles being fired from every direction so checking the projectile against the enemy from the bottom from the top from the left and from the right I'll, I'll also pause the projectile as well so it doesn't um, it doesn't get in the way um, the, the movement of the, the the enemy doesn't get in the way of kind of projecting uh, pre predicting what should happen and what should not. Um, 225, play one projectile type. Okay, why is that not being picking up? Enemies? Oh, because it's called projectiles, that's why not enemies. But seriously, Edifos, uh, I mean, massive credits to you for the. the, the the stuff that you found already okay what have i just changed that has just changed that because something has gone wrong now and that's not picking up what did i just change i changed I don't actually remember what i changed oh projectile type if it's equal to zero then then completely skip it so let me just i just want to make sure that that actually was the thing that changed <clears throat> okay it was that as well okay so let's go and have a look at the projectile type because it seems like the projectile type is wrong oh actually i know exactly what it is um <clears throat> projectile type is not y uh, not x it's y there we go <clears throat> So what we're trying to prevent is if the projectile dies when it hits the floor, then it doesn't still cause a collision. Um, so there's a projectile dead here, and it's not causing a collision. That's perfect. Way success. I'm I'm happy with that. Uh, okay, so let's just double check that player two can can hit things. Which it seems to be able to see if it can hit that flying sprite, which I think it can as well. Yep, 
Yep, it can. It seems to be able to hit that flying one perfectly fine. Cool. Um, you know what? I'm not quite done yet. So what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm going to take this. If it collides, we set the colour. But what I'm also going to do is... Turn the sprite off as well. Turn the projectile off. So now the the projectile should uh, finish as well. Thank you for the follow, Ninja Bunny. Ninja Bunny nine thousand. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome to the stream. Okay, so the projectile is kind of stopping in midair, which is a bit annoying. I'm not sure why that is. Um, So it's definitely stopping its update, but it, it's drawing in midair, which is a, a little frustrating. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna comment this out. Um, no, actually, you know what? I'm gonna figure this bug out because this is something this is something we need to figure out, right? This this is this is the last bit, and then we've basically got player projectiles working correctly, and we can start looking at stuns. So. I don't know if Foro is still on the stream. Um, I need to. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's still on the stream or not. Um, but if he is, oh, thank you for the follow, Bashinerox. Bashinerox, cool, nice name. I like that. Um, but if he is, then um, yeah, some um, stun animations would be really good. So we need to have a think about how the stun animation works. We want it to be consistent across all all enemies we want um whatever whatever effect we apply to the enemies we want it to be the same across all enemies so it's very obvious if you if i show you a static of a screen um hey for i uh yo if i show you a static of a screen you need to be able to tell from that static that these are the enemies that are stunned these are the enemies that are active so um if you can come up with a nice way of doing that that'd be really cool um, and we'll, we'll implement that on the next stream, I guess. Hey, yeah, no worries. There's a. Uh, I'm surprised this stream is. Oh, actually, no. I'm on the sky now, aren't I? I'm on. I'm on the landline, uh, internet. So that's probably why it's still working for me. Um. Oh, I think I missed a. I think I missed a follow as well. Uh, Anthony Pereira, thank you for the follow. Uh, I didn't realise uh, you'd, you'd clicked follow. I must have been having a smoke at that point. Okay, so let's work out why sticking projectile type to zero is not enough. So let's go and have a look at the projectiles. Because the projectiles do disappear perfectly well when they hit a platform. So let's work out why they may be different. So, um, update projectiles. That seems fine. Moving complete, wide speed adjustments. To do should we just use soft sprite hang on soft sprite xy directly yeah okay not a huge thing <clears throat> actually flashing's not a bad idea they could they could cycle through a specific set of colors so we've got this set enemy color uh, we could have a very specific non-standard color which signifies that they are stunned um, and then maybe bare minimum we could have them um, flip upside down um, because that that avoids the kind of other horrible 90 degree rotation problem that we get so we could just have them kind of flip upside down um, once every eight frames or something like that as well as cycling through um, a non-standard color as well now it'd be really obvious then you'd be able to look at them and go actually that sprites upside down and it's this weird red color um, that doesn't exist in the in the in the c64 palette so yeah and that would be very easy to do because we could just have a single frame which we flip upside down um, as well as another frame which already exists in the normal cycle or in the normal animations so we'd only need one extra sprite. Um, yeah, actually we'll go with that, I think. I think we'll go with that. That's easier. 
could maybe flash on or remove their black border. The, the borders would be a problem because the borders are a multi, uh, are a shared color. Uh, they're one of the multicolor values, so that wouldn't work. It would have to, it, whatever we do with the color would have to be with the um, individual colors for the sprites. <clears throat> but that wouldn't be a problem. I mean, if we pick, if we pick two, if, if we go to our, our table here, for instance, um, and the thing is, is with it being, with it being a stun mode, it could be a bit more flashy. It doesn't have to be a stable color. So we could pick something like this, for instance. This red and red and pink color that combines. It's quite a flashy color. You can see here it flashes a lot, um, but it is kind of enough to tell you that actually this is this is a bit more than something that's just standard on the screen. This is something you need to pay attention to. This is a stun sprite. You need to go and quickly do something with that. Um, if you wanted a stable color, I mean, there's plenty of stable colors to pick from, but um, I think having something flashing isn't too bad, to be honest. So maybe, maybe this is the right thing to do. And the way the way this will work, by the way, guys, is um, we've got these behaviors here, right? Um, but what we could do is um, down here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to create the function here now. Uh, I'm going to call it stunned behavior. Uh, and I'm just going to put uh, an update in here. And basically what we'll do is, is the first thing we'll do in the update is we'll check is it stunned. If it's stunned, then we will jump to this subroutine in here. Uh, and then in this subroutine we will do something like we will uh, set enemy color and if we have a look at our our sprite list we had if we choose this one here so this is red and pink so this is uh, two zero two and zero a in hexadecimal so if you pass that in in here so now this if if something is stunned then we will go into into this function we can even do the check in here it doesn't have to be we do the check in in this lot we can just check in here so we could do um oops you know we can load the enemy state in here we can do a check in here to see if it is actually stunned or not um, and if it is we can set the enemy color and then what we can do is if it is stunned we can just do uh, This and what this does is it actually pops the uh, the jump to subroutine uh, Return address off the stack and return so it basically exits this function It's like a if you've used c64. It's like a break It will allow us to jump out of this routine stops doing anything else in here and just does what's in here and then exits um, otherwise we can just return and go back to the normal routine. So I'll leave that in here because that's a good one uh, The 218 plus 8 is correct. I was mixing up the top and bottom of the projectile I noticed that 8 equals 0 where it was was when projectile bomb hits the enemy team But then kept thinking about 8 equals 21 to... Yeah, exactly. So the, the the overlap between the projectile and the sprite is not just the width of the sprite, it's the width of the sprite plus the projectile. So there are uh, there are 29, uh, sorry, 30 possible positions, so 0 to 29, um, in which the projectile and the sprite will overlap. So that's why the 21 plus 8 exists. Um, if it's 0 to 29, it's fine. If it's anything else, it's not collided. Um, cool. Okay, I think on that note, I'm going to leave it here then. Um, I'm going to go onto Twitch online and see if I can find somebody to to raid. Um, I think it's been pretty good tonight. I think we're getting quite far. Um, the code is getting slower, but it's because the code is getting more complicated. So we're having to find more um, sneaky ways of, uh, of doing these things and... Um, that does mean we're going to have to we're going to have to continually find kind of um, 
not fine, but we're going to have to solve lots of these little bugs as they as they crop up. But hopefully the way that we've designed the enemy behaviors will mean that these bugs will be fairly limited and we'll just be able to build the behaviors out of these um, these these macros. But every time we change these macros, we're going to have to think about them. So we did a has hit projectile. We did a, um, what was the other one we did tonight? Um, actually, we didn't do any more macros after that, did we? we? The other one was actually in the behavior itself. Um, but most of the most of the, the debugging will be done on a macro level, so we can just reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. And actually, do, the more enemies we add, the easier they will get to add. So, um, okay, I'm going to raid Clipper because Clipper is um, is my usual raid attack. So let's go for that. So Clipper plays uh, Mega Man quite a lot. Uh, Mega Man X. She's just she's a speedrunner for for Mega Man One. Uh, sorry, Mega Man X. Um, and a really cool streamer. Some really cool stories. Some she's quite funny to watch. So um, thank you guys. Thank you for joining tonight. Um, just a reminder. Um, in two weeks' time, we'll be doing the the twelve hour stream, which is actually thirteen hours because of the uh, daylight saving time. Um, where we'll be doing a Halloween themed side scrolling shoot 'em up from scratch in 12 hours. Now, considering it's taken seven hours to solve a tiny little bug in here, um, I'm kind of kind of <laughs> dubious as to whether or not we'll manage to do that in time. I hope we will. I've, I'm I'm probably going to practice a little bit of the code this week just so I know. I'm going to do all the code from scratch, uh, but I may practice ahead of time. Um, so once again, thanks guys. Thanks for joining the stream. Let's get R Clipper on the raid. Um, why did that not work? I thought that had worked. Okay, let's try again. Am I doing something wrong? What am I doing wrong? Uh, let's try it in. Let's try it flute in um in here. Oh god! I was about actually type the right things in. Ah, there we go. All right, cool. Yeah, cheers, guys. Thank you for joining along. Thanks for all the follows and all the, all the subscribes, and thank you for all the help in getting this done as well. It's um, it's been really good. I've got like probably about a third of a glass of wine left, and then I'm gonna go to bed. Um, yeah, cheers, guys. Take care. A uh, good night, and uh, see you on Thursday where we'll be doing the um, dissect of Overlord, but we'll hopefully be adding uh, mouse control into it for Gunstar. So see you then. Cheers guys, bye.